Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW, and with me, of course, is the man with the plan. The reason we are all here today, Jesus Christ. No, I'm just kidding. It's slightly lower on the totem pole. BQ, say what's up to the people. What up, everybody? (laughs) The one who made it all possible. (laughs) It's funny you bring all that back up because we're going to get into this episode of Impact pretty quickly, and I'm feeling like the old BQ who, like, fell in love and was you know started this channel for you know the positive voice of impact wrestling and then over the years i just started souring on it and like i'm, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling good again i'm feeling really good um you also look really weird without your mustache and beard goatee <laughs> thank you for pointing that out to the people uh i'll just yeah. stay behind the mic like this like uh what's no the- you don't look you don't look weird Wilson? it's different no yeah it's not weird uh for for those of you who probably never heard of it there used to be this great sitcom called home improvement with uh tim allen tim the tool man taylor and every so often whenever he needed advice on something he would go out to his backyard and consult his neighbor wilson but we never got to see wilson's face because wilson was always right behind the fence just like this yeah. So we only got to see Wilson from here up. <laughs> so uh, so today I'll be Wilson. No, uh, what, what happened was, listen, I keep it real with the people, okay? I, I, I'm i here for the truth, okay? And I will <laughs> I will deliver some truth out here to Impact Wrestling Nation. I had a shaving accident. So the um, this Am- uh, uh, Amarion uh, variant is out here, um, and, and it's running wild like Hulkamania, brother. And I've got and, it. Uh, yeah, so you got it? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, How I'm on the doing? tail end. I'm on the tail end, man. It it didn't hit me hard at all. Okay, good, good, good. Thank yeah, goodness. a whole Thank household goodness. got it. Oh wow! So, are you guys back? <laughs> uh, me and me and the old lady. Yeah. Okay, so okay we gotta get the kids got, got, right got, away. Little ones. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Actually, I uh I have a six year old, and I think I think my six year old is gonna get it this week, just because um you know I feel like you know listen I saw some of the potential long term effects that could happen. And in my opinion, I feel like as a parent, I'd be doing my child a disservice if I didn't get them any protection that p- could possibly happen. Like going to school, right? Like j- just by the nature of going to school, you're going to be around a ton of people. So there's going to be uh, variations of the way people are protecting themselves. Like a lot of people are like, screw this. It's been two years. We got to live our life. We're going any and everywhere. Right. And, and, and a lot of people are like that. And a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so, but, but, but by sending your child into that, right. Like you're, you're naturally, you're going to get a mix and you're bound, you're bound to come across it. Like it's just, it is what it is. And so what actually happened was my six-year-old got, uh, had to come home uh, with a sore throat last week and my wife and I were just we were shook man we was like oh man this is crazy you know uh you know I hope it's not that luckily it was just a little sore throat and you know and the kid is doing fine but um that all said right like I was just thinking to myself like man it'd be crazy if like you know you know there's like like I said there's like long-term effects and I think that like the idea of not protecting your kid from something like that when you can is just something I can't do so so I, so I think I think my uh, my six year old is gonna get back this week. Um, where was I? Going? Shaving. You were talking about the shaving accident. Oh yes, yes. No, so because of this, yeah. because of this, I uh, I decided I'm probably not going to my barber for a few months. So uh, okay. So I'm like, um, so I'm probably I'm probably I'm probably gonna gonna bick the head. You know what I mean? I'm probably gonna bick it or at least buzz it down. Um, and I started with with my chin and my stash. And what happened was I just messed up the mustache. Not gonna lie, this is a this, this is a really <laughs> long way to say I messed up the mustache, so I just cut the whole thing off. Um, so I was like, you know, what I mean, let me just let me just rock with it. Let me just rock with it. You know what I mean? let, me just, let me just ride this thing out. My hair grows relatively quickly. I already got the stubble going. It's a shame, like I don't grow like a full beard because I always thought like the five o'clock shadow looked really cool. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, when you when you got like that halfway stubble going in, you're just like, oh yeah, I'm a real man. You know what I mean? Yeah, my like, my facial hair looks like Captain Caveman. If anyone even knows yeah. how that is, old Santa Barbera days are just random, 
<laughs> it's like the Patrick. dude uh, from from Sonic. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Uh Robotnik. <laughs> yeah, 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 man. That that's exactly what it is. Just coarse hair that's painful and hurts <laughs> yeah. pokes yeah. anyone within a couple inch radius of me it just hurts. Um yeah. so I, I can't wait to get back to my barber in the spring. Like, you know what I mean? I'm I'm pretty sure what I'm hoping what I think this is gonna be going forward with COVID, you know, hopefully, is that we'll just have like flare ups, like flu season like normal. But we're still yeah. in a place where enough people aren't um, trying to manage it where like, uh, you know, we're like, it's still a thing. Like I said, like, you know, like I, I love my barber, but I'm pretty sure he ain't about that vaccine life. So I'm like, ah, I can't, do it right now. <laughs> can't do it. And if you listen, every man out there knows, you know, turning your back on your barber is one of the hardest things to do. But uh, I'm not willing to go on a ventilator so I can get a fresh lineup. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so so on on future episodes of the pod, you guys are gonna be checking out a nice clean baldy. Okay, I'm gonna get my uh, who's a fat man with a bald head? Who's a, who's a who's a uh, oh Mark Henry? Mark Luther, Henry. <laughs> Doctor Luther, Doctor Mark Luther. Henry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Either or, either or, either or. <laughs> Uh, Michael Clark Duncan, rest in peace. <laughs> uh, yeah, so y'all gonna get some of that coming up. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I gotta. I'm gonna let the face grow back before I take the top off. Then you know what I mean. Then I'm gonna let y'all see my uh, my fat Michael Jordan and all this. Shaq, yeah, Michael. Shaq, okay, there you another, go. There you go. An another man. Now Shaq's the best example, right? Shaq's the best. Oh, Rick Ross, right? Rick Ross is Rick Ross. Oh, yeah, Rick Ross. Yeah. yeah. Yep. See, listen. You can be big and sexy and bald, okay? It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. So I'm a King Hippo. I'm, I'm King Hippo. Who's King Hippo? <laughs> that's that's way too old school for for some of these people. Is that Hungry Hungry? No. <laughs> no from Mike Tyson's Punch Out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So listen, bald, I, I'm here bald. to I'm I'm here to be a bridge, okay? Be a bridge for people out there. I've always I've always felt like a. Uh, like a um somebody that makes other people comfortable. Like when I go to the pool, okay, um, or, or the beach or anything like that, like I got no problem taking off the shirt, gut and titties all out. You know what I'm saying? So uh so the other the other dad bods around can feel comfortable. Like, hey man, look, if that guy's out here without a shirt, like, I'm cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what's up. Yes, I, yes. I yes. gotta say to everyone, I know on, on YouTube land you see our Twitter handles under us talking here. I was hacked on Twitter today, dude. Like uh -oh. So, and I have the two factor authentication set up and everything, and I still get hacked every, every month. And oh, it's, man, but it's really? usually a matter of like, I, I get a notification, hey, change your password. Mm -hmm. And um, today I was getting the notification every like 30 minutes. It just kept saying change it, change it. And it kept, it kept texting me like, hey, um, authenticate, like send, you know, use this code. And I kept doing it all day, all day. And, and, the dude still got into my account, man. It, it was wild. And for about two hours, my account was tweeting, uh, tweeting, tweeting Bitcoin GIFs for oh. just every like minute. It was just, and I had to keep, I was able to get on through my web browser because I was still logged in, even though my password was changed. Nice. So I was, uh, I had to keep deleting all the tweets. Like, but then Twitter is so funny because they're like, well, hold, my whole point of saying this is that my Twitter handle BQ Speaks is not my Twitter handle at the moment because they changed my, my handle. Thank God I have a backup account that I was able to like change to BQ Speaks. Right. But mm. Twitter is weird because they're like, click this link if you've been compromised or hacked. And then you click and it says, well, go ahead and this is and the next step is to log in with your password. It's just like, but I don't have the password because I was hacked. So then you try to log in and say, I forgot my password. And it's just like, it's, it just takes you in a circle and doesn't actually reset your password for you. It, mm -hmm. it, it's just, I forgot what it is after that. I, I put in there, I don't know my password, it's hacked. And they're like, well, you have to log into your password to change the password. It, 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 I mean, it's your account to change the password. It's a complete mess, but I finally got in to where I blocked that person out. I got him out, but I can't change my password yet. Oh so my God. Weird. Yeah, you know, remind like... me, remind me before we get off. I um, I uh, I have a I have a great password, not not a password for you, but uh, but a password structure, um, that I learned. It's a it's a it's it's, it's a corporate thing that we learned at my job, and it's actually okay. it's really good. It's really good. I, I I'll pass it to you, and 
Um, and I haven't had any problems. I, I don't think I've ever, oh, God, probably jinxed myself. But I don't think I've ever been hacked since I started <laughs> using using right. this method of password. So interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's pretty good. Um, down, but down. that said, what uh, what's the latest and greatest with Impact Wrestling this week? Because we've been, you know, we 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 we've been. Uh, we, listen, this is what a week. What a week, right? Ooh, I mean, it yeah. feels like we're. It feels like it was for. It feels like Hard to Kill was forever ago, but mm-hmm. um, but it was only seven, eight days ago. It was only eight days ago. Um, but what a time to be alive, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What a time for to be an Impact Wrestling fan. Now, I know you went live after after the show and you gave your thoughts on it. But um, for anybody who maybe didn't hear it, you know, what what was your, what was your your thoughts and impressions coming out of Hard to Kill? All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna throw it back to you because obviously you, you got, we gotta give you the platform to talk about it too. But this freaking pay per view. So I've said a, several times that Hard to Kill last year was my favorite pay per view, even mm. though there was no fans and everything. I just thought it was outstanding. This shit blew that out the water, blew everything out of the water. I, I can't think what a better pay per view Impact put on in the longest in a while that I can even compare to this. You know, people bring up Slammiversary from, I don't, maybe was it 2017 or 18, the one that had Penna versus uh, mm-hmm. Sammy Callahan and all that. And I remember that being a excellent pay-per-view and everyone was just buzzing over it. But I, I remember a couple matches not really doing it for me. Um, I think, I remember Tessa and Allie had a match, which was a little clunky. I think that was the one where Eddie Edwards and Tommy Dreamer had their match and there was fake blood and uh, staple guns and shit and i was i just wasn't into it but this yo this from top to bottom even the freaking pre-show uh i, I log in for the pre-show thinking we're getting the <laughs> the the uh the advertised match and we get jake and right. fulton i was like well what is this but that match was still cool <laughs> but but as far as just like really top to bottom i thought the last two matches that fell off a little bit uh the two main events yeah. I, I thought at that point it got you know, they they got a little TNA on us in the main, in, in the men's main yep. event. And, yep. You know, uh, but other than that, man, what a what an amazing pay per view. Yeah. I, I just you know the commentary was incredible. The matches were great, um, and, and I felt like there was a theme to the pay per view. It's not just called hard to kill. Like the story they seemed to tell in all, all the matches was that you basically had to kill your opponent to win, and that's that's kind of what. If you really look at all the matches, that's kind of the way they they played out. Yeah, but it was uh they they Impact Wrestling like a plus. You guys killed it. Whew. What 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 were your thoughts on it? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean I, I echo a lot of your sentiments about it. The pay per view was outstanding. Like I was live tweeting through the whole thing, and I just could not believe that they just were having this excellent show like match after match after match after match and i was like oh my god and by the way um once the live show started a black wrestler run won in just about every every just about every match so they got to the josh alexander's jonah match when i was like you know okay well i guess this is where it stops (laughs) but (laughs) but but i was like oh yeah no and listen by the way that's not like a qualification for me to win i mean for me to enjoy a a product at all but it's just funny because it was like it was it was uh, uh relevant um, pertaining to some of the other conversations that have been going on around the world of wrestling lately. Um, but no, I, I mean, look, the, the, the matches were great. The matches were good. And by the way, I felt like this show had less matches than most impact pay-per-views. Right. Am I right about that? I feel like there were like, there were, there were like six matches on this show. Something yeah. Like usually there's eight. And there were six, but there was supposed to be the knockouts tag team title match. Thank that didn't God. Happen, Thank which God. Was probably a, blessing in the sky yeah totally that listen if we're if we're gonna be totally honest and listen i mean this with no disrespect to madison rain to neil dashwood or the uh jesse lee and whatever her name is like i, I mean <laughs> this with no disrespect but like that match would have completely killed the vibe of this show because yeah what they ended up without that match they ended up with an excellent pay-per-view of what impact wrestling can be what Mm -hmm. impact wrestling can be impact wrestling can be a show where we get bust ass matches that you have to talk about and that's what we got 
match after match after match was a bust ass match that you have to talk about. The Ultimate X match was so good. That match was so good. The um, oh my god, the, the, the Trey and Macklin again, so good, right? Like uh, the, the hardcore war, a match I thought was just gonna be like right time time wasting bathroom match. That match was also good. And then they did the, the Ring of Honor invasion thing afterward. I, I mean, like, yo. So I felt like they took the suggestion that I've been saying for so long, which is to adapt the NXT takeover style of building your card for a pay-per-view, which is to give me four or five bust ass matches. It doesn't matter if the show's a little shorter, you're going to go home with a show that you can't stop talking about. And that's what impact needs more than anything else. Right. They need people out here talking about how good their show was, how good this product is right now. And honestly, if they would have put that 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 knockouts tag team title match on, it would have killed that vibe. And right, again, right. I, I don't mean that with like no disrespect to these women, but nobody thinks that those women were going to go out there and maintain that level of match. Not even close. No chance. No chance. And I think that needs to be the vibe, the build of Impact pay per views going forward. You know, like make people feel like you know what? If I don't like the show. If I'm not following the show, I know I can tune into this show for two and a half hours and get my money's worth, get my time's worth. You know what I mean? Hop on Twitter in some conversations and be like, oh my God, did you see that? You know what I mean? And they absolutely delivered that. Um, I think like, just like you said, the, the, the two main events, the world title and the knockouts title, I thought they overbooked. I thought they booked themselves, you know, a, a little, a little, a little, they just did too much. You know, was there two ref bumps in the in the moves? Yeah, Cardona? two. Yeah, I mean, like, come on, man. This is there. This is there was too much. Like, you know, if you if your main goal here long term is for Josh Alexander to take the title off of Moose and for that to be Josh Alexander's crowning moment and have Josh Alexander be your hood ornament going forward, then Moose needs to be booked like the strongest champion possible. Okay. What happened at WrestleMania this past year? Roman Reigns was against Edge and Daniel Bryan, two legends. He stacked them and pinned both of them in the main event, okay? Moose needs to be doing that to people. I'm sorry. Right. I know. Agreed. I, is, is that disrespectful to the performers? Yes. Yes, it is. But does it make your champion feel like a big daggone deal? Yes. And that's what I think Moose needs. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, if he were to stack them and pin them, that would be, like, just straight up copying off what they did at WrestleMania. And that's the last thing Impact needs right now is for people to say they're doing it. But what I'm saying is that Moose needs to be a dominant champion. Just let him be a dominant champion so that it matters when somebody beats him. You don't need, you know, 100 ref bumps and Chelsea Green getting hit in the head with a chair. Like, it it just, you don't don't need that stuff. You don't need it. Like, let Moose be the dominant champion that he looks like. You know what I mean? He's presenting himself as somebody who will do any and everything to keep his hands on that title. Let him be that. Let him be look dominant, unstoppable, even when he has to be a weasel, still dominant and unstoppable. That's what Moose needs to be. Now, the main event. First of all, the knockouts opened and closed the show. Give it up for the knockouts. Give it up for the knockouts. That was fantastic. Um, they, they opened the show with a bang. That Ultimate X match was fantastic. And the the main event, I thought the main event, I thought they tried to do a little too much. Um, first of all, I thought yeah. adding adding that you had to get a, a pinfall or submission and then get the ten count, I thought that was a that that was a really unnecessary rule change. Like we've seen Texas death matches in Impact before. If you guys remember, Bully Ray and EC3 had a Texas death match at Slammiversary. I want to say in 2016 or 2017. It wasn't uh, that late. It was well before that. Bully Ray okay. wasn't even in the company at that time. Okay. So, but but go look up the Texas death match that Bully Ray and EC3 had. And, you know, again, to add the element that you need a pinfall, it was confusing. If you guys remember, because um, early in that match, uh, Mickey got a roll up on Deanna and there was a three count. And I was like, what? And and then the ref started counting. Deanna popped right back on her feet. And it was so confusing to everybody. So I, they did not clearly explain that there was going to be like a fall 
and then the count. They didn't clearly explain that, and they should right. have. They should have explained that. They, to they've never been good about there. that. They, they've never right, been right. like, here's crystal clear. Like when the, when the pure rules happen, what do they do? Hey, here's the rules of the match. Yep. They Impact's never done anything that. like that. Right. And by the way, when they had the pure wrestling match, I was looking at that and I actually tweeted this. I said, if Impact ever did a match with this many rules, they would get ro- – Twitter would explode from all the people roasting Impact for having a match yeah. with as many rules as that pure wrestling championship match, by the way. Um, and that match, I wasn't a huge fan of that match. I mean, it was really? cool. It was it was cool, but, like, I just – I'm not a fan of the no-selling, bro. I, I can't stand that. If you give somebody a power bomb, followed by a knee to the face, followed by an elbow strike – they shouldn't get right back up and give you a super kick. Right, you know right, I mean? right. I totally if agree. It's, if, it, if it's a thing where it's like, oh, so, where you build to a spot where somebody is like, you know, selling like crazy, but just, 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 just firing off their last little bit of energy to like deliver one move, like that's one thing. But yo, they will literally take five moves and then turn around and give five moves and then take four moves and then turn around and give three moves. And I'm like, dog, like, what are we doing here? What are we doing? So I felt like there was, I felt like there was a lot of that. So that just, that style just, I'm not a fan. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You you know what this, what this made me realize though. So years ago, impact tried to do the grand championship. I I enjoyed the tournament, but then after that, the the title sucked because Aaron Rex was the first champion, didn't fit his style and it just turned to shit from there. And then, you know, now they have the digital championship, digital media, where they're like, it, it doesn't have rules, but it's supposed to be contested on social platforms and shit like that. The pure rules, I think, are fairly simple, mm-hmm. but it showed it showed us like there there is a way to create a championship that you can do something different, just just small details, and it make it makes a world of difference in the actual match to where they the matches are really unique. Yeah, and I, I understand everything you just said, but I mean, these were real simple: three rope breaks, yep. you know, handshake, uh, only one closed fist. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just like you're—they you, didn't overdo it, but they found a way to make it unique. So it's—it's it's like, um, yeah, I mean, like to me, it, it didn't make the match hard to follow at all, right? You know, what I mean, like it didn't—it didn't disturb my viewing at all. Um, it was just, like I said, I just thought it was funny because I think that if if this had been an impact match concept, I think people would roast it because just that's just what they do to impact. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but overall, like Hard to Kill was amazing. The energy tweeting about it on social media was a lot of fun. I love seeing all the um, the people who were like live front row taking pictures and, and posting videos. Like it just it was dope, man. It was a it was a great night to be an impact fan. Um, to be interacting uh, on social media. And by the way, if you guys don't stick around to the end of the show, um, we always give out our, our social handles. Look at them. They're on the screen right now. And just make sure you're following us along. Like I said, because we, we live tweet Impact Action. You know, we're always having conversations on social about uh, Impact stuff. And moments like that are the best time to be on Twitter. Hell yeah. And... I will. The last thing I want to say about it is the way they laid out the matches, as far as the order of the matches. I can't remember the last time they put a pay per view with that good of flow, and it, it goes back to what we, we were saying a second ago about the knockout title match. If that match was in here, it would have disrupted the flow of the of the ma- of the the show. And I know we were getting on here last week saying, "Oh, well, they shouldn't be doing title matches in the in the pre show." I'm kind of changing my mind about that because. The knockouts tag team titles might have been best better off on the pre-show. It, it, it would have worked. I just, I always feel like the minute you put a title on the pre-show, it means nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the digital media championship is perfect for the pre-show, but you know, right. I mean, the title. You know, the well, well, they, well, something they could have done in terms of show flow. They should have done something to try and like bring the crowd down a little bit before the Moose Morrissey Cardona match. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? So that that delivered, but <clears throat> but the way they had that the way they had that match book, I don't think it would have mattered. Um, they just they they overdid it. But it but like I said, I would like to see a very dominating win from Moose. Like I think yeah, that's what we need to get into. You know, from now until the time Moose drops that title, like he needs to just be plowing people. You know, do all Impact did an excellent job building up this match. By the way, everything on TV told us that 
Matt Cardona was going to get his big redemption story um, and win and finally become a champion uh, at Hard to Kill. And I think that's what you're supposed to do. That's how you that's how you build up, you know, uh, anticipation for a match where if you take a step back and look at it, duh, Moose is winning. But I I like I like building up a good quality, credible story. Um, WWE did this recently with uh, Liv Morgan. Liv Morgan was taking on Becky Lynch for the championship. I was like, there's no fucking way Liv Morgan is winning that title off Becky Lynch. But the way they told that story, they made it feel like it was Liv's night. And of course, Becky crushed everybody. I'm like, that's great. That's exactly (laughs) how you should do it. And I think I want to keep seeing that. So um, all around, and hats off to everybody. Oh, let me ask you specifically about the Knockouts Ultimate X match. Did you think that delivered? Did it over deliver? Did it under deliver? How did you feel about that? So I think it was exactly what it needed to be. And, and by the great way, I totally agree with you on Moose. Uh, that's one thing Impact has to work on is, is to just tell themselves, hey, we can make someone look strong in loss, in defeat, I should say. Like they did it with Steve Macklin very well. He looked very strong in defeat. That's never been a strong point of theirs. That's why they go to the ref bumps. They go to the, the surprise roll-ups, you know? Um, so hopefully we see some improvement. I thought the ulti- Ultimate X match was exactly what it needed to be. And, I, you know, I, some people kind of had, had their comments when I said about this, about this before. I was like, I don't know that the women have the upper body strength to, to you know, go get the, to shimmy across, mm-hmm. you know, hang and get the X. When Jordan Grace first did it, you heard the crowd pop. And you notice nobody else did it. Uh, I, I think one mm-hmm. other person did a little bit and then she fell. Yeah. I, I think it might've been Chelsea Green. Cause they fell on, um, on uh, Tasha's face. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else, you, you know what I mean? So they were very select. They didn't keep going for the X all match. Yeah. And there was times where, you know, you saw Alicia climb it, you saw Lady Frost climb it, and then they would jump off or yeah. something, or something would happen. Um, so they did a pretty good job in, in preserving their strength mm. because it, they're, I mean, the women are all in great shape, but they they probably only have, their arms probably only have so much life in them to, right. to hang from that thing. One you, thing you know, that I can honestly say that, themselves well. one thing that really stood out to me from watching that match is how elite of an athlete Jordan Grace is. Like you have got to, like, I, I don't want to hear no doubts about Jordan Grace and her athleticism, her ability to do anything. When she, like <laughs> right. you said, she was she was scaling across that rope, you know, with her two hands. She had people hanging from her. She took two flat back bumps off that structure, hanging from the X. Like Jordan Grace, man, woo! She earned her paycheck that night, man. Like she did a phenomenal job, phenomenal. And I, I'm scared to death of heights, so I mean, I I can only take my hat off to them for for doing that stuff. Like I'm scared to death. I just can't even imagine imagine doing that ish. Yeah. But yeah, um, so that was outstanding. I thought it was exactly what it needed to be. Um, just like when we first started talking about this, you know, there's multiple ways to do a match. You know what I mean? There's multiple ways to do a match. And by the way, you know, I, 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 I absorbed some good media about this match. Um, there was an article, I think, in Sports Illustrated. Um, I think there was, a, there was an interview on Busted Open. Like there was a few things that I saw leading up to that ultimate X match, but I saw them like the day of and the day before the match. I'm like, yo, why wasn't this out weeks ago? I love the, 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 I think it was um, Sports Illustrated. There's an article with Scott Demore, and he was talking about how, you know, the idea for this ultimate X actually came up at a show last year. They put the structure up over the ring. And I think he said like Jordan Grace and Tasha Stills were like really bugging him about it. So he took them out to the ring and he was like, all right, show me what you got. And they were, you know, climbing across and doing their thing. And he was like, okay. Huh, huh, huh. And, you know, and then he decided to save it for hard to kill, which by the way, um, I want to say something else too. Scott Demore, if Scott Demore is not in every conversation for promoter of the year going, going forward, like people need to just kick rocks. I will say this too. If, if you, if there's any, if there is any promotion that you follow, uh, excuse me, any publication that you follow, any type of dirt sheet or anything like that, if they're not listing Scott Demore as uh, as a potential, you know, promoter of the year, then you need to just stop paying attention to whatever it is. 
because they're clearly like just biased against impact wrestling. And I told you a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I was, I was tweeting back and forth with, uh, I think it was Jack Farmer from, um, from the, the, um, oh, what show is that? The Mac mania, Mac mania podcast on Spotify. It's a dope show. My man, uh, my man, Brian H waters actually produces that show. And I was tweeting back and forth with, um, with uh, some of the guys about their their year end predictions, and I was saying how you know how do you have this conversation and not include Deanna Perrazzo and uh, the homie you know Jack Farmer he tried to he tried he tried to big time me he was like oh well at the end of the day she's on a show that got seventy eight thousand viewers last week and I was like oh that's trash like that is just, that's trash like you're basically saying that her contributions what she's done doesn't matter because the show doesn't get a lot of viewership i'm like just yeah that's irrelevant i'm like bro like that's just trash like you just you can't front on the work that she did over this last year you know what i mean like you just you can't you can't like the you know the the viewership the show gets like that's something out of her control and you know we can have a whole nother conversation about the validity of those numbers but again just try to like to discount the work that people in impact are doing because of the viewership numbers like that's just, I think that's just, that's a real, um, that's a real, like, you know, that's, that's a cheap way to avoid just saying, Hey, I don't watch the show. So I don't know about it. But, um, but again, look over the course of the last calendar year, impact wrestling has worked with every major promotion in the world. You have, including WWE, by the way, including WWE, like y'all better start putting some respect on Scott DeMore's name, man. Give Scott Demore his respect for what he has put forward for Impact Wrestling. And speaking of viewership, let, let's talk viewership. So the viewership for this episode, I guess you could call it the fallout from Hard to Kill, it did jump up from 104,000 to 111. I can never say those, 111,000 <laughs> views. So the jump was only 7,000, but uh, the, the key demo went up from, I'm not going to give the actual rating, but it went from 24,000 people last week to 38,000. So that was a 14,000 uh, person jump. And that, and um, that's what we want to see. We want to see younger people getting into wrestling um, or getting into impact and, and, and following it. So that, that number give is... That, give me that key demo number again. So it was, um, well, 24,000 was the actual, the pers- the, the people watching it. Mm-hmm. No, I'm sorry. Thirty-eight thousand was twenty-four was the week before, so it was like a point, you know, zero three. Point zero three. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, no, I think that's how the math works. Point zero three eight. Right. So, I mean, to me, right? I, I mean, the okay. So the the key demo part, um, I think that's great. I think all of this is is great, but at the end of the day, right? Like the answer here is because hard to kill got great buzz. So if you're impact, if you want to keep seeing numbers like this, you got to keep finding ways to get great buzz, right? Like it's it's not rocket science, is it? Like nothing about this is too hard. If you want to keep seeing great numbers, if you keep, if you want to keep seeing your numbers increase, uh, uh, you know, what, whatever it is, however you want to call it, you want to just keep generating a positive buzz. You have to find a way one way or another by hook or by crook to generate a positive buzz around your product all the time. So the positive buzz, again, we just talked about, you know, hard to kill. The buzz was undeniable, right? All the the positive conversation was undeniable and it translated into more viewers. Right. And we want, we want to see the number go up. I mean, if it's 6,000 people, it's 6,000 people in 6,000 people is a lot of people now in relative to other wrestling shows and television shows. No, that's not a lot of people, but 6,000 people is a lot of people. Uh, So we just, we want to see, you know, that continue to grow, grow. If, if the viewership was to grow by a thousand new fans a week, you know what I mean? Again, in, in comparison to other TV shows, that's nothing, but you know, that is, that is pretty, you know, decent growth. Uh, given the you know the step backs the company has dealt with over the years, and um, we just want to see that number go up because there's there's a lot of times where we come off a of pay per view or we come off you know we came off a turning point 
viewership was down. You know, we're sitting there, damn, t- Turning Point was great. And then what's the viewership going to be? And, and and that's disappointing when when they are doing good things and then the numbers dip. Because it's like, okay, well, they did something good, but it wasn't enough for people to say, okay, what's next? You know, you know which is kind of how good episodic television works. You know, you're supposed to leave an episode saying, I can't wait for what's next. I can't wait for next week. And I don't know that they've always been able to capture people with that. You know, they've, there's times over the last couple of years, they've, they've, you know, mounted a pretty large amount of buzz and then weren't sure how to capitalize on it. You know, the, the Kenny Omega thing is a great example when he, you know, when he first popped up on the show and then it was like next week, just right back to normal. Cause they didn't know how to, how do we hit them? You, you, you know? So it, it was really good to see it go up, yeah. you know, cause there was, hey, there was a lot of positive buzz. Nah, man, you hundred percent right. Like, Oh, that night that they had Kenny Omega coming on, like, of course they couldn't have known exactly what the number was, was going to be. That was going to be a boost, but you certainly anticipated a boost. That's the whole reason you did it. So they should have came out with guns blazing that night. They should have had a, a they should have had a damn pay-per-view plan for that show. They should have had a pay-per-view and a cliffhanger plan for that show, but instead like they allowed like uh, I remember Jay-Z talking about this years ago, right? Years ago um Jay-Z left uh he left, you know, Def Jam and I'm oh, sorry, he left uh Rockefeller Records and he was the um he was the president over at Def Jam and then he had you know, he had a couple of, 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 of CDs coming out. He had one for like, I think Memphis Bleak and the Young Guns or whatever. And neither one of those did great numbers sales wise. And in an interview later, you know, Jay-Z basically said like, yeah, I think I was just relying on like the strength of the brand to basically sell these CDs. And that's exactly what Impact did right here with Kenny Omega, right? Like they just were relying on the strength of that Kenny Omega is gonna be on your show to keep people coming back. And <clears throat> again, like half the people who tuned in were like repulsed by impact. They were like, right. Like, Ugh, there's nobody around the ring clapping like AEW. Ew. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, um, so I mean like impact should have been like, yo, we got Kenny Omega on the show. This needs to be our best impact of the year because yeah. we want this audience to come back. Like we, we need these people to say, okay, um maybe i'm not seeing kenny omega every week but i still want to see what's going to happen to rich swan next or whatever you know what i mean so so they certainly missed on that but um but yeah i mean like the 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 fact that hard to kill was a a huge social conversation and the viewership was up for impact this week you know is not surprising at all you and you hit on the net the nail on the head talking about the power of the brand because if you remember a week, a month or so ago, we were just like, why aren't more people talking about uh, Ultimate X? You know what I mean? And it was like they were relying on, hey, the knockouts are going to have this Ultimate X match. Uh, what? And then, you know, expecting all, all the numbers of fly in social media wise and all this, all the people talking. And yeah, yeah. With what would what did we say back then? Impact fans were talking and that was it. And, um, you know, I, I said something on Twitter they were promoting a throwback throwdown. I said, why don't we have, why isn't there a new video every day? Again, it's in my social media mind. Why isn't there a video every day of a new knockout a video mm-hmm. package in this mm-hmm. downtime where you're talking about this guy's dressed like bend over and this guy's jackass and all, all that stuff. <laughs> throwback right, throwdown. Right, right. <laughs> all right. So this is downtime. Why isn't there a video package of Tasha Steele's, saying why yes, she yeah. needs to win this yes and it's showing clips of all of the iconic ultimate x spots yes. while they're talking so that people who aren't familiar with just the brand the name of the match know what oh shit that's what they're gonna do hell yeah you know hell yeah just show and, the and again too it. like you know again i i kind of touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the lead up to this um to uh when i was i was making the case for the idea of a knockouts having their own their own uh, hour long show. Like there are so many women in wrestling media right now. Like, you know, again, um, I I talked about some great interviews I saw with Chelsea Green and Deanna Perrazzo on those wrestling girls podcast. Um, I I, I talked about, uh, I I mean, if you guys haven't seen, uh, there's a a young lady named uh, Candice Cordelia 
who does uh she does a spot on busted open every week and she's a writer for uh for pwi pro wrestling illustrated and she does she does i think the past this past month she interviewed like I don't know, a, a lot of people from like this this indie promotion or whatever that was having like a big show. But there are so many women in wrestling. A, a, Alicia Atout or Tout, whatever her name is. Like Atout, there's, yeah. so, <laughs> there's so, you know, R- Renee Paquette. Like there are so many prominent female voices in the wrestling space. I, as much as Hard to Kill was a huge conversation topic, they could have, this Ultimate X match, this Knockouts Ultimate X match could have alone b- buoyed this pay-per-view to to unprecedented levels. But you got to promote, man. You got to get in that space. And listen, I I don't know. Um you know, I I don't I don't know um how, how much effort they're 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 putting into some of these things now. Like I, listen, I know it's not easy to run a wrestling company, but I do know that when you put together a show, you have certain attractions for the show, right? Mm-hmm. Like um uh, again, like what would you say honestly the 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 biggest thing we knew was an attraction for the show was the announcement that Mickey James was going to be in the Royal Rumble as the Knockouts champion if she retained her title, right? Like other than that, honestly, other than that, what big promotion did we hear for Hard to Kill? <laughs> yeah, you got, you got a point. I mean, there was there a lot was... of impact buzz around the time, but it wasn't necessarily right. and, Hard and, to and Kill. Again, you like, know. I think like, man, listen, I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. Impact is leaving money on the table by not rolling strong behind the knockouts right now. It's, it's not necessarily that I think this knockouts roster is like the greatest thing you ever saw. It, it, any honest conversation I have with anybody like, you know, WWE's women roster right now to me is just, it's just so, it's so incredibly top heavy, right? Like, I mean, you know, the top of that roster, you know, Charlotte, Becky, uh, Bianca Belair, Sasha Banks, like, you know, uh, Rhea Ripley, like the, the top of that roster is untouchable, but impact puts, I think more effort into their knockouts. Uh, well, uh, it, it, the, the impact knockouts division has a great reputation. I'll say that. Yeah, and I yeah. think, I think they have a clear and a way path to be at least number two. Okay, Um, like you're never going to top the star power of like Charlotte Flair. Um, You're never going to like the the WrestleMania moment that Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks had. You know, that's 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 not for you. Okay, (laughs) You're not you're not going to top that. Don't worry about that. But Jordan Grace right now, like, look at what she's doing. She is busting ass on social media, like killing it, killing it. Like, look at the way she performed. Tasha Steeles, look at the way she performed. Again, when given a chance to shine, Tasha Steeles has been amazing. Deanna Perrazzo, again, Mickey James, while you have her. We don't know how much long you're going to have her, but you got her now. Like, listen, I just think, like, as, as good as that was, I think Impact is missing the boat here by not going full steam ahead by just giving the knockouts division their own life. I think, you know, again, like you said, we, we should have been getting every week, we should have gotten a profile on somebody in that in that Ultimate X match. That's six weeks worth of content. Six mm-hmm. weeks worth of content. You do, you drop a video package on Monday. Let's do a live interview on Wednesday. Then we got the show on Thursday. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, you drop your Jordan Grace video package on Monday telling us why this match is important to her, talk about her life journey. Then let her do one of those, one of those live streams on on Wednesday with uh with Ross and uh and <laughs> and and and, and just, you know just interview her about the importance again like boom you boom you boom you you know you 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 the content is right there the content is right there and again when uh Joe uh, when uh Gail Kim was fussing down Rachel Ellering she said that they just changed over social media um their their social media manager so I mean I'm just saying man whoever's in charge of this. Listen, like, don't, I don't know. I don't know what else they have in the bag uh, for the knockouts coming up, but I hope their plan is to keep pushing because this knockouts ultimate X match was something people had a lot of questions about it beyond delivered. And you need to see what else you can do with the knockouts to keep pushing. You know what I mean? Like um, I just, I think they're in a great place. There's a great opportunity. There's a great, 
support system in terms of media there. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, you can put, you know, Chelsea Green and and and, uh, and Tasha Stills and Deanna Perrazzo, like, have them do the media rounds with all these outlets who want to cover women's wrestling. So, you know, I know that was a little bit of a tangent, man, but um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I I think I think it's it's a an important point. It's a, it's an extremely important point. So there's there's no uh never got to apologize for talking about the knockouts. It's all good. Uh, but we're gonna let's move along here. Pull my notes back up. Um, so we're gonna get into this episode uh, very very quickly. Um, we're we're gonna talk about two more a couple more things. I also want to say. Um, there's a new, we got a new Facebook group, uh, Impact Lounge Engagement Group. Uh, you could, you could look for, look it up. Um, I, I'm not concerned about growing it as big as humanly possible. I'm uh, starting very small, want to make sure it's a good group, an engaged group. Uh, we don't have people in there asking stupid questions, um, asking why not Undertaker from TNA, uh, shit like that. Um, <laughs> If you guys are part of some of these other groups, you know what I'm talking about by, make, by making that comment. Um, you know, no one's gonna no one's gonna ask, you know, stupid things. Why why has an impact sign this? You know, the Rock and shit like that. Like we get in some groups, it's it's just gonna be a real raw conversation, uh, but mo- mainly mainly positive. You know, I, I know I can get on my my negative rants, but that's not what the group's about. So just look up the uh, Facebook. Um, I mean, excuse me, the Impact Lounge Engagement Group on Facebook. Um, you got to answer a couple questions just so I know that you're not, you know, uh, not just some troll, not, not some clown. So uh, real quick, there, there's a quick rumor that came out and I, I say rumor because it came from the, the YouTube admin. Um, I know some people swear by that person. I, I'm like, don't listen to them. You know, if, if the news comes out cool, um, I know many things they've said have come true. So I'm not saying, uh, they're, they're a complete liar, but, um, <laughs> Unless it comes from, you know, uh, just the impact Twitter, I, I try not to put too much stock in it. But um, I have no idea what this news is, what this potential. No, but the, oh, just but the rumor that you know impact might be coming to YouTube TV. Um, oh, okay, okay. That's four million more homes. I I have YouTube TV personally. Um, mm-hmm. I actually watch Impact when I do watch it live on Philo because we actually have Philo and YouTube TV, uh, two streaming services. Yeah, but. <laughs> sometimes you got to subscribe to multiple for certain channels. Um, but that's usually where I watch it. When I do watch it live, I watch it on a Philo. Uh, I, I watch it on YouTube once and did not enjoy the experience. So, you know, that, that's how I rock with it. But if it comes to YouTube TV, awesome. It's probably not going to improve. It's probably not going to improve the chance of me watching it live. Uh, just because I, I, I just don't watch it live. I just, I, I just don't, I just have other stuff going on at that time. But, um, you know, it's four million more homes. That's more people, you know, that, that could have access to it. So it's a good thing. If that's what happens, I, I, th- I think that would be wonderful because the best thing Impact can do is in- increase the, the footprint of, of Access TV. Like they're not going to get I, – I really think they're going to be on Access TV for the immediate future. Uh, you know, people are, oh, then get on this big network, this and this. Like they're not doing the numbers and they don't have the social media engagement numbers. They have the followers, yeah, but the engagement numbers – they don't have anything that's that's telling one of these larger network. Ooh, let me get in on that. Let's just, if we're just being completely real. So the best thing they can do is in, increase the footprint of Access TV. Um, have it uh, because you know, as I said, I watch it on Philo, uh, but I I've subscribed to Hulu Live. Didn't have Access TV there. Uh, I've, I've subscribed to Sling TV. Uh, had Access TV on Sling TV. Um, that used to be that used to be what I watched TV on, but. Uh, they took a couple channels away, so I had to change the YouTube TV. And um, I'm trying to think what other ones are out there. But it, it's very hit or miss if you're going to get access TV. So you just want to have it um, in as many places as possible. You know, so you got any thoughts on that, though, YouTube TV? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I you know, listen, if, if it's more coverage, you know, potentially more homes, I, I just, I I don't know TV watching habits as opposed to how they used to be. You know, I think like there was a time when being on a network like Spike, uh, you know, which was in more homes, it really meant something because again, like people say that people don't just channel flip anymore. That's bull crap. People do channel flip. 
Um, but I don't know that people channel flip in that way with their digital services. I think like, I think people more just go to whatever it is they were going to watch, whatever it is they were looking for. Um, but that said, I think being in front of more homes is never a bad thing. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think like, you know, there's still more people, if you're in more homes, that's more homes that'll, you know, potentially have open the channel guide and see a wrestling program and say, Hey, let me check this out. So I think there's, there's always that. And I think there's a lot of viewers that actually come from that, by the way, right. People that are just flipping the channels and go, yo, let me check this out. I used to be a wrestling fan when I was a kid, or, you know, I'm a lapsed wrestling fan. There's so many lapsed wrestling fans. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think there's a potential that it could lead to more viewership. Again, I think people's viewing habits are different now. And also, you know, I hate to harp on this, but I just don't know how accurate the data collection methods are. Um, but if it's in more homes, then I think that should lead to more viewership. Um, you know, again, I think the impact just got to do their part is in terms of, you know, advertising the product in terms of, um, you know, creating buzz on social media, you know, doing those things to make the product feel like something that will go to our friends and say, yo, you should check this thing out on impact. And then when people watch it, that it feels like something fun that they want to stick around to, um, you know, NXT, right. Again, like I, I got into watching NXT from listening to the solid monster sounds off podcast. And he used to do NXT recaps on his show every week. And when he would do the recaps, like, you know, just uh, eventually I just gave it a chance because he made it sound interesting. I was like, let me just check this out. So I gave it a chance and it was fine. It was cool. Um, but the thing that I always felt was the star of the show with NXT was the audience, you know, the, the, the yeah. crowd chants and how loud and active and lively they were. And for me, it was annoying because I hate like chanting for the sake of chanting. I just think that's stupid, but I understand that that's what fans view as fun at a wrestling show now. So impact needs to do more of that. They need to get their crowds and people to do more of that. I'm talking about all this in relation to ratings, because when people tune into impact, they need to feel like this is a fun show that they want to come back to that. They want to tell their friends about. And at the end of the day, the wrestling audience, the internet world is still so stuck on TV viewership. Like they no shit could do 300,000 on YouTube and no one would bat an eye, you know, right. like, so for instance, you know, NWA the first year there in business was on YouTube. They're coming back to YouTube here soon, but they were on YouTube strictly and there was not a single episode of impact on television that outdrew what NWA did on YouTube. YouTube is different because sometimes you get credit for, you know, you watch part of it one day and part of the next, you get credit for two views. You know what I mean? Like granted those, so the numbers um, are definitely skewed, but no one ever gave uh, NWA the credit of saying, Hey, 300,000 because the first episode had half a million views on YouTube and then it started sitting around 250 to 300,000. No one was ever like, Hey, 300,000 people are watching NWA. It was nobody's watching NWA. That's, that's how right. they treated it. Uh, Cause they didn't have a TV deal. So, right. you, you know, you want to see those TV numbers go up because the wrestling audience for whatever reason is, is really stuck on, on that on television. They don't care about these other streaming things. They don't care if 10,000 people also watch on Twitch or, you know, on the, you know, 5,000 people also, 10,000 people also watch on YouTube Insider. They're, they don't care about any of that. Right. You know, they're just still TV, television. So, right. Uh, hopefully we get that up. Uh, let's see. There's a couple other things we can get into, but we can get into it during the review here. So, because I really want to get into this episode. I know we've been, uh, there's just been so much to talk about, um, so much to get excited about. So we haven't been able to, you know, talk the episode, but so let, let's get into it. And then, uh, you know, some of this other stuff, I'll factor it in there. All right, let's do this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they had two. Oh, they had an exclusive match on BTI of Black Tarus versus Matthew Raywald. We are definitely not talking about that. Um, <laughs> this episode started off with Chris Bay versus Laredo Kid. Uh, we have the X Division. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, let's see. This show started with W. Morrissey storming into the impact zone and demanding 
that had the Impact World title match. Did he get an Impact World title match against Moose tonight? Morrissey claimed that he had Moose beat in the triple threat match this past Saturday at Hard to Kill, but the referee was unable to make the count. Moose appears on the big screen and says that there will be an Impact title match tonight, but it won't involve Morrissey. Instead, Moose is going to give the opportunity to someone who has never challenged for the title before. Morrissey vows that Moose isn't going to make it to his title defense tonight and storms to the back. The invaders from Ring of Honor return as Matt Taven, Vincent, PCO, Mike Bennett, and Maria Cornelis confront D'Lo Brown and Tom Hannafin. Bennett and Vincent attack D'Lo Brown at the commentary desk before PCO puts him through a table with a top rope swanton. Uh, how'd you feel about this? Did you see this this part of the show? The, this uh... was freaking amazing. Um, I I I laughed in a in a good way when D'Lo was was selling like back in the Attitude Era. You know, like he they gave him a couple punches and he's you know selling like the old D'Lo. I, I thought that was that was funny, dude. But I I think it's good for the D'Lo character if he's gonna remain on color commentary to get a little sympathy. I think that helps any character in wrestling. Um, and I, I think he got that, uh, cause these guys straight, I mean, I don't remember the last time I, I, it has happened in wrestling, but where you just took out the color commentary commentator to start off the match. I mean, it was just so, it was just different from what we see on impact. And I've been talking a while about, you know, it's this cookie cutter show and is, this is the format they use and da, 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 da. And it was just like, with this episode, it just felt like this threw everything out the window and, um, you know, as I said last week or the week before, if I'm going to say, hey, they have to fix this and fix this and fix this, it would be uh, unfair of me to not point out that they are actually fixing all these things uh, nice. that I've been, I've been talking about. You know, even the ring apron today was black. It gave a little contrast, you know, had a little daughter's whatever movie, which I hear looks really bad, but um you know, at least these are movies coming out in theaters. They're not just like straight to DVD. Like what, you know, what the hell is this? But, um, you know, I thought, I thought just the, the ring apron provided a little contrast and it just seemed, um, I even felt like the camera angle of the match was just, I felt like the camera was down just a little bit because usually you see him wrestle and you see that the impact logo just floating all over the place in the background, which I think is distracting. And I didn't feel they were, I could see that this episode. I felt like, camera was down a little bit and we were just like focusing on the people in the ring um so there, there was just a lot of little tweaks that they made i thought that i thought were just excellent uh the, the the crowd it sounded like the crowd had a lot of energy but it was also quiet at the same time um so the, whatever mixing they did uh i thought they compressed the crowd heavily but you could tell there was energy it didn't feel like it was quiet but uh it should have sounded a lot louder, but this whole segment here, I just thought was excellent. It just had me right away, just on the edge of my seat. Like what's, what's next here. Um, and they did a good job of, they're not making this a ring of honor invasion where there's just like, they're making it clear. These are these rogue individuals, but they made it very clear with Roxy and David, Gre uh, Jonathan Gresham. I don't know why I call him David, uh, that they're not a part of this. So they're, they're, making it clear this is not a ring of honor invasion you know yeah. so I, I i think that's um that's good and yeah. that's smart the, this was wrestling uh the wrestling the wrestling community has turned invasion into a dirty word um yeah, yeah. you know like most people um you know again it all dates back to wwe and their 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 invasion angle uh with wcw and ecw back in was 2000 or whatever year that was and, yeah. um, you know, it was watered down. It was no fun. And by the way, spoiler alert, because WWE didn't do an invasion well, no one is ever going to do an invasion well. Yeah, right. Okay? <laughs> In the eyes of the fans, they'll always associate the word invasion with that. And so people will never see an invasion as anything being done well. Like, I keep telling people this all the time. And I said this back when they started with the with the um the impact aew relationship like just get this invasion stuff out of your head man and everybody's not trying to be wwe okay and like wwe has been doing wrestling for 50 60 years like of course they they've done everything okay but everybody's not trying to redo an angle that you saw in wwe so like you got to get that out of your head like just watch stuff for what it is 
And again, I did, I, I do think they were kind of, you know, standing on a line as far as whether or not this was an ROH invasion, right? Uh, because Scott DeMore was like, I got to call Baltimore and see what's going on, right? Like that implicated ROH as a whole when really they should have been like, yo, this is um, whatever they call in this group, the OGK, right? The OG kingdom. Um, like just, they should have just, just called it that, you know what I mean? Just call it that. Like get away from this ROH invasion thing, man. Like yeah. one thing, and I know this might sound a little rude or crude, feel how you feel. This is how I feel. And I'm gonna say it. Uh, ROH, man, everybody said their goodbyes. Let it be. Let it be. And I think that, like, you know, I, I know a lot of people are, are you know, not going to like that. I'm not saying that people shouldn't have a place to work, but, like, what's going to happen, and this happens with TV shows all the time, by the way, is if a TV show has a small niche audience they, and they hear that TV show is getting canceled, that small niche audience will get loud and they'll send letters and all this stuff. And then that TV show will get renewed in some much lesser form and come back and be way worse than it was before it got canceled. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like, and, and so that's kind of what's happening here. Um, we, every, listen, the wrestling world said it's goodbyes to ROH. Uh, I'm someone who didn't even watch ROH, but even I, you know, tried to pay it all the respect it deserves. So let it be. Do we want to come back and do this again a year from now? Like with, with ROH trying to run shows, uh, one show every four months and, you know, attendance dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And, is, and, and it becomes to the point where it's basically like an impact show that's being done under an ROH banner. Like, just let it go, man. Just let it go. Like, I, again, you know, you got Jonathan Gresham. Uh, John, yeah, that's the name. Jonathan Gresham. Yeah, now I'm just belt, throwing random names and, out there. Uh, and 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 uh you know roxy was carrying around this belt more on that later and um and you know i'm sure there's some tag team belts floating around out there somewhere like look man like people said their goodbyes man like people said their goodbyes roh had a great effect on the wrestling business its legacy will never be denied roh changed wrestling forever and it's over just let it be over all right so what was reported was that PCO was actually signed with Impact. And uh, they haven't said about the other members yet, which is probably smart because even if they are signed, you want to keep that under wraps a little bit because there's a storyline going on here that they're invading, invade, you know, invade. I'm using that word, but they're, they're invading there. And Scott's calling Baltimore. Like you're not going to call Baltimore for your, for five people you have under contract, right? You know, so um, <laughs> right. for six people, you should say, so, you know, you, right. You got to sprinkle that on him a little bit, but, uh, yeah. you know, PCO, I, I don't know. I, I know the dude's up there in age. Um, I don't know a lot of his work. I, I watched him wrestle when I was a kid, uh, <laughs> with the Quebecers, uh, right. but I haven't known much about him since then. So if, if he's an asset and if he can, if he can pr provide something cool, all good. Yeah, but. I, you know, I, I, this is one I'm not. I'm not being on. I'm mean, like, I don't know much about PCO, but I, you know, I think that like the thing is, you know, he does like all these like death defying stunts or whatever. But I'm just like, bro, like, is this going to help impact at all anyway? That's all I'm saying, right? Like, right. is this something that's going to make viewers stick around? If you think it's something that's going to make viewers stick around, then cool. If not, then like, I think the Good Brothers, the lesson we should all learn from the Good Brothers is. Having a buzz from New Japan does not equate to American viewership sticking around. Okay. Right. Have we not learned that lesson from the Good Brothers? Um, yeah. I mean, like, come on. It's just, you know, it is what it is, man. And uh, and I'm and I'm about ready to call shenanigans on the whole Bullet Club thing, too. But we can. Oh, <laughs> speaking of which, Chris Bay versus Laredo Kid. <laughs> um, X Division champion Trey Miguel joins Tom Hannafin on commentary. For this clash of potential title contenders, uh, Kid hit a springboard crossbody, then soars to the outside with a burst of speed. Bay gains control with a moonsault to the floor. The flurry of springboards continues as Bay hits an elbow drop for two. Laredo dives through the ropes, colliding with Bay on the ramp. Bay hits a spine buster, a spine buster brain buster combo, but Laredo kicks out. 
Then Laredo connects with a top rope Spanish fly to win. I was a little surprised to see uh, Chris Bay just take a straight up clean pin there. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. What did what, you think about this? So I thought, I thought the match was really good. I thought, I thought it was fun. Uh, you know, they're painting a couple guys who have not beat anybody in forever as, you know, potential next in line for the X Division Championship. And that's that's what I think is so weird in wrestling. It was like Laredo Kid was just part of this three-way. Uh, he took the pin, and somehow he's back in the, you know, topic of number one contender. And then Chris Bay and the Bull Club haven't beat anybody in a while. I, I say I haven't beat anybody. I'm sure they got a couple – wins here or there, but they haven't been presented as winners. Right. So, yeah, you know, that's what I'll never understand about wrestling, <laughs> at least modern, modern wrestling. You know what I mean? But I was, exp- I was, I was definitely surprised to see Laredo kid win. Um, I, I never expect him to win when he goes out there. So that was wild. And normally this is where I'd be, I, I start talking about, man, or, cooling off the bullet club. And I know the bullet club's not as hot as it once was, but they have a lot of name value. And it's just like, wow, they, you know, I don't want to say they're being done dirty, but they're not, they're not presented to be a big deal. But now I feel like there's more to this story because now we know gorilla, gorilla, gorillas of destiny's coming and uh, Jay white's coming back. And now it's like, okay, that's starting to make a little more sense. Uh, Maybe that's part of the story that they, that they're losing. They need these guys who, who knows what it is, but they're definitely injecting a little bit more life with the fact that we know these guys are, are going to show up. So I'm not tripping too much about Chris Bay losing. I don't think Trey Miguel has a future in commentary, uh, <laughs> but, but he, but he said it. Okay. He said some funny stuff. Uh, he, he said some that, you know, like a fart in church, but yeah. for the most part, he <laughs> said it. Okay. But, uh, I think what I like that he added to the booth, though, was I brought this up months ago when Deanna was in the booth during one of Mickey James matches, and I, you know, this was back when D'Lo and Stryker. I say back when is three week, two, three weeks ago, but uh, D'Lo and Stryker were just just rehearsed and everything was robotic, and it was like Deanna when they had Deanna in the booth. I was like, wow, she's so natural. She's adding a, a natural element that the commentary is missing. So I said, I hope they do more of this, and. I did get that with Trey a little bit. Someone who was just coming, you know, he, he sat there. Again, no future in color commentary, but he was very natural. Uh, and I liked, I liked how he, what he added to the match by doing that. He was kind of taking shots at Chris Bay the entire match for whatever reason. I mean, they're just out of thin air. These guys haven't have an issue unless I'm forgetting something here. Uh, but they, he spent the whole time in a sense, you know, Chris Bay, you know, you want this title, da, 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 and then Chris Bay loses the match. Like it. Right. That was just out of left field that he actually lost. Right. That Spanish yeah. fly is sick by the way, but yeah, but it was a fun match. But I'm not, I'm not tripping too much about Chris Bay because reinforcements are on their way. Okay. All right. Well, I'm interested to see where that goes. Um, actually, I think that could be going in a different direction. I, I think that the bullet club is showing up to kick Chris Bay out. That's what I think they're, I think that's why they're coming, but well, at least I think that's the storyline they'll go with, but we'll see. We'll see. But actually, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, 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 let's dive into this a little bit. Sorry for the tangent. Okay. But okay. if the Bullet Club is showing up to kick Chris Bay out, right, that's going to effectively turn Chris Bay babyface, right? So will that be leading to a Jay White Chris Bay match? And if so, that could be a huge match for Chris Bay. That could be a huge match for Chris Bay. <laughs> um, but if, 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 how does impact i mean like do they have a good amount of like heels and baby faces right now like what would would this be the right time to heat up chris bay you know it, it, i i like I, i'm i'm just curious as to like where you think this could be going do you think this could be a situation where so if they do if the bullet club shows up to kick out chris bay and then let's say this leads to a program where jay white is going to have a match with chris bay and chris bay will you know like get the get you know get get revenge on Jay White for kicking him out of the Bullet Club, then you know Chris Bay boom elevated right there right. So then what do you do with Chris Bay right? Then do you build up Chris Bay and let him challenge Moose? I wouldn't have a problem with that actually. I would not have a problem if if you if you had Chris Bay go on like a nice winning streak and then have him challenge Moose for the title 
and you know not get it or you know challenge moose for the time or, or or you know build up to the point where he's challenging like josh alexander to see who gets a chance to face moose like that could be interesting too like there's ways you could go here man like i think they're you know again chris bay is such a talent like he shouldn't not be a feature player i i agree but i feel like we're going to go back to the top of the show here. We're talking about just relying on, on the name and the brand. I think that's what they try to do with Bullet Club, to be totally honest with you. I think there was no plan for them. They were right. just like, oh, we've got the Bullet Club. That's all. They just, in, in, in name alone, will, you know. So, will again, so I think this, 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 this presents an opportunity to get rid of it, to, like, kind of wash it, wash it clean, right? Like, if you say, so let's, so okay, so these guys are showing up for two nights of TV taping. That's effectively four weeks of television right they're saving two episodes a night right that's effectively a month worth of television so again so we do so we get them they, they show up they kick chris bay out now we got some beef between chris bay and jay white let's say this leads to a pay-per-view match or impact plus special match whatever and then you know again chris bay let's say gets the win over jay white now you got a hot chris bay right and so then what do you do with chris bay now that's wishful thinking i don't think they'll do that at all you know, I don't know. If anything, it'll be like just a quick segment where they'll show up and say something slick or whatever. I don't know. But I think that could be a great opportunity. You got these guys, you know, you got them for, for two nights of television, which again is effectively a, a month worth of TV. You know, let's use these guys. Let's do something. Let's elevate Chris Bay, a super duper star. If you just do something with him. And I mean, why not, man? Why not? I don't know where it's going. Um, my whole point was I, I wouldn't – I don't think they have anything s- that special storyline oh, plan for them. I think they're just going to be like, hey, the Bullet Club's here. We're going to have yeah. some Bullet Club matches. Yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I would imagine they're going to challenge the Good Brothers, but the Good Brothers seems pretty deep into what's going on with, you know, this other we'll – we'll get to all yeah, that. Yeah. But All right, you know. here we go. So Rich Swan, Willie Mack, Eddie Edwards, Rhino, and Heath split up in search of the ROH invaders. See, they're using this actual word, invaders. Brian <laughs> Myers returns and, dis- and is disappointed with the Learning Tree's recent performance. Myers tells VSK and Zicky Dice that they need to prove themselves as Dice reveals that he's Moose's opponent for the Impact World title tonight. <laughs> That's, I mean, come on, give me a fucking break. Uh, all right. Yeah, so let me talk about this real quick. So the, the learning tree at first I thought was funny and it was as much bad comedies on this show. And I, you know, I think right now I want to say with hard to kill and even f- from turning point, you see them getting some of the people they've gotten rid of. I think the bad comedy is going to be a very small portion of the show. There was a point where it was like half the show because they were, when, when Swinger first showed up, they had him, which Swinger is funny, but to make my point, they had him in like three different storylines on the show for, for a couple months. And it was just like, oh my God, dude. And it just felt like everything was what was comedy. And I think they're getting away from that now. Boy, my cat is pissing me off. I'm sorry if he comes over the, uh, the recording here, but um, now I kind of lost my train of thought from uh, what I was saying before the comedy thing. Oh, so with the learning tree, it was something I was entertained by. Why did they break Sam Beal off this group? Like he was, he was the one thing that made it entertaining and funny. And now you took him out of the group and Mm -hmm. what's he doing? Like, what was the point of that? You know, like he, he's not elevated. He's not doing anything. You know, what, what Mm -hmm. was the point? Like that, that really worked out well. So I, I don't understand that. Um, Yeah. I don't know what happened with uh with the Sam Bill. I definitely thought that the whole point of this story was going to be, you know, the platform to elevate Sam Bill, but clearly they haven't gone that way. Also, like, you know, we don't know, you know, uh, with, him, with, 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 with with every influx of talent, there's a outletting of talent, right? So if we haven't seen Sam Bill in a few days, it's probably not unintentional. So, um, you know, we shall see what lies ahead for the homie sam bill um and i mean brian myers was off to you for a few weeks who knows exactly why that was so you know we'll, we'll we'll see where all this is going uh all right so we got jake something against speedball mike bailey 
So Speedball Mike Bailey made his impact on Access TV debut going one-on-one with Jake something. Ace Austin joined Tom Hannafin on commentary after losing to Bailey in a four-way match at the countdown to Hard to Kill. Bailey drop kicked Jake something on the outside. Uh, something quickly turned the tide with a power bomb on the hardest part of the ring. Something hit a strong forearm for two. Um, then I'm not going to read this play, play by play. Uh, Mike Bailey, Speedball Mike Bailey has a great move. It's a double knee. It's double knees to the back off the second rope as he's doing like a 450 backflip. Like it's crazy. It's wild. Um, speedball, speedball Mike Bailey, man. Like I thought he was dope to watch. Like what, what do you think of speedball and, um, you know, Jake something is, uh, he appears to be an enhancement talent now. So, um, what are your thoughts here? I'm super impressed with, with, uh, speedball. And when he was signed, you know, Lewis sent me a message like, Oh, this is huge. I was like, I'll take your word for it. I've never heard of him. You know, um, he's impressive. He's one of my things that I've been getting on is, is the offense on impact and the moves like the, the, the matches are good. The selling is good, but it was just, you know, I keep saying, where's the cool finishers? Mm-hmm. Where, where's the, the finisher that, you know, I remember being younger when Matt Seidel was Evan Bourne, dude. And when he wrestled, he was the first one to do the Meteora, and that was like a huge deal at the time. But when he was going to do that shooting star press, like you were watching the match, like for the shooting, like you couldn't wait for the shooting star press to happen. Now everyone does it, whatever. But not everyone, but you, you know my point. But I keep saying, where's the cool moves and impact? Where's the, where's the cool finishers? What what DDTs and close? By the way, Mickey James needs to retire that DDT after freaking hard to kill. That awful. Anyway, that move is badass, and he he's. He adds something that the division is missing. He he one hundred percent does. And Jake something, you know, they said uh, the report was that his contract's up at the end of February, I believe. He's not going to be. I don't. I, I don't think he's going to be back. I don't think he wants to. Honest. I don't know this for sure, obviously. But you see the way he's presented on TV. Rohit yeah. is one of his best friends in his world, and I know that because uh, I know Rohit. So <laughs> they're great friends. I just don't get the feeling impact sees anything in him i shouldn't say it doesn't see anything in him they don't see in him what we see in him right right, and you know they haven't given him you know i always say that about alicia and this is obviously a completely different type of athlete but i say what what could you know someone what someone's capable of if you don't give them anything to do if you don't you don't give them a a story you know cody it broke him up cody diener's one been one of the featured parts of the show forever now you know, they, they saw more in him than, than they did in Jake. Um, so I don't see why he would return. I don't know what else is out there for him. He might just say, hey, um, what I was told in the past that he, his independent booking schedule is booked up pretty good uh, after being involved with Impact. That's, that's what someone had told me in the past, mm-hmm. which I would imagine is probably true. He might just be like, yo, I, I can make a living off the indies and um, – he wrestles local locally here quite a bit, so okay. he's presented as a pretty big deal. And um, the way we see him on Impact is, is not that. I don't know if they feel mm-hmm. like his, that name is just not doesn't work as a as a main event type of. T- it's a great indie name, you know, but maybe it's not a television name. That's why they want him to be Cousin Jake at first, which was, you know, I'm gonna kill right, this right, cat. Right. You have no idea, but um, don't kill the cat. Don't kill the he, he's uh, yeah I, I think he's on his way out i think this is yeah. like the the goodbye tour for for jake yeah. unfortunately oh yeah yeah definitely i mean you can you can tell that right by the way they're presenting him by the way that they're you know booking him and beating him like he's completely insignificant uh and again you know just like you know we looked again we looked at impact you know at what was like the beginning of last year or whatever it was and we said you know we identified there's like, you know, probably five or six talents they can build this roster around uh, young guys. And we thought that Jake something was one of them. Um, but like you said, it's clear, if nothing else, that they don't see him that way. Um, and so, you know, again, it's best to move on. Like if you don't want to just be content getting a paycheck, because here's the thing too, even if he goes back and works the Indies for a while, he can get his value up, get his brand up, and he can always come back as a, as a monster. Like, you know, that's the good thing about wrestling. Like, you can you can refresh your character just by being off TV for a little while. 
you know, you can go off TV for a little bit and, you know, get refreshed with the audience and then you can show up and be something totally different. You know, um, it just, it is what it is. That's just the way it works. So, um, so, you know, for him, if he doesn't get any offers from AEW or NXT, which yeah, I don't know how old he is, but you know, I've, I've heard NXT is being very strict now who they're bringing in in terms of, you know, wanting people who are younger and, 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 you know, more malleable and that type of thing. Um, plus Jake, something's been wearing, um, he's been wearing like a compression wrap around his right thigh for like, for as long as I've seen him wearing those trunks. And um, yeah, that's an indicator of, you know, some sort of ailment, you know what I mean? Um, and so, so somebody might be looking at and looking at that and going, you know, is this guy healthy? Um, so, you know, you, you have that compared with the fact that we see him, you know, not being presented strongly on TV and those things aren't great for your brand. So, um, you know, he has a chance to go out and make some money on the Indies, more power to him. I hope he's buying insurance. I hope he's saving his money. And, you know, you know, it is what it is, man. But, you know, if impact's not presenting you like, like how you feel you should be being presented. So, you know, get out there and make your money, man. There's money out there. Go get it. Um, all right. So Violent by Design convinces Impact World Tag Team Champions, the Good Brothers, not to break off their business arrangements of the two groups working together. Heath and Rhino then are found laid out in the back as the Unholy Alliance deals further damage to their rivals. Um, we see Gia Miller interviewing Matt Cardona and Chelsea Green after they both came up short in their respective matches at Hard to Kill. Cardona failed to capture the Impact World title and Chelsea Green was unsuccessful in winning the first ever Knockouts Ultimate X match. Then Green notes that she was the one that actually unhooked the X from the top of the Ultimate X structure. But Tasha Steeles pried it out of her hands. Tasha Steeles and Savannah Evans interrupt, leading to a confrontation. Green challenges Steeles to a match next week before knocking her off her feet. Did you have any thoughts on this segment here? So the first one there with Violent by Design and uh, and all them, I don't know why Eddie was like, hey, the best thing we can do is is break up. Let's split up um, and, and, and look for these guys. Let's look for this group of five, uh, but but let's break break off. He's obviously do it. never been in a horror movie. Right. It was like bad horror, yeah. Um, <laughs> they all got their asses whooped and um, – they probably just could have found him in the ring later in the episode. So um, I, I've i got a legitimate fucking... Ch- there was a, I, it got a legitimate chuckle out of me when um, they're like, oh, Heath and Rhino. And it's like they went to go check on him and then started whooping their ass. Like, I thought that was so freaking funny. There was this uh, on, on Raw, like a good 12 years ago. It was... Um, a backstage segment with Mr. Anderson and super crazy and uh, super crazy. I don't know. I don't know if he just had a match or what, but he was like walking around backstage and um, Anderson or Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy back then. He walked, super crazy. You okay? And then super crazy just looks up at, and then Kenny just starts beating his ass. Like I thought that was so fucking funny back then. I know I'm not <laughs> presenting the the best you know, you know, picture here of of what that angle was. But I just remember at the time thought it was so funny that for a second, he looked like he was just checking on him and then just started whipping on him. Right. Uh, It it gave me some (laughs) flashbacks of that. So I thought it was funny. The GM Miller uh, stuff with Chelsea and, and, and uh, I thought Cardone and Chelsea look really bad in this. They, they they came Mm -hmm. off really weak to me. They just seem like this, uh, I'm sure it's going somewhere, but it's, it's maybe it's the heel turn we've been wanting, but it's, it's just like they're kind of being presented as this baby face, you know, want to be power couple, but they can't win. So I, I, I don't, I don't know. That's probably not what they're going for, but it just, they came off kind of weak. I can see a heel turn coming. I, I think yeah. um, that uh, you want to say Zach Ryder, uh, Matt Cardona has been playing a heel on the Indies and it's pretty good. It's pretty yeah. good. Um, he does this really corny thing where he like he'll make a song out of like uh to the tune of like uh bye 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 from NSYNC out of like whoever his opponent is. Um, and I think it's <laughs> I think it's it's fun. I mean, like it's you know it's it's him like it's a little bit hokey, but like but but it's fun. I'm like, why not? You know what I mean? Like I feel like um you know the the happy Zack Ryder you know lovable loser thing like 
you know, let him do something different, man. Let's let's just let's see. Let's see. I think it's gonna be tough to ever present him as like your top champion. Um right. but again, like just give the world a chance to see him as something different. I think this is a great example. And I was saying this about uh Brian Myers for the longest time, is like, you know, he's someone who never really got a chance. And if we're being honest, these guys never really got a chance in WWE to show what they can do and so but by the same token their names and faces that the world knows because they were on WWE TV for years so give them a chance to flex their muscles and see what they can really do um again like you don't just take them and you put them in the main event you don't do that because then people are like oh you guys just you know do you in WWE ex WWE cast offs like no Give these guys a chance to come in and build some legitimate buzz. And then if they can do that, then you give them a shot. You know what I mean? Like build some real legitimate buzz to the point where you can be like, okay, Matt Cardona is moving the needle for us. Let's put a bit of main event. You know, I was at uh, the TNA taping when Alberto El Patron debuted. And, um, you know, I've, I've told this story a little bit before that the place came unglued for this. I, I, I'm, no one would ever know it because on the on his on the um the big screen behind him they wrote Alberto Del Patron instead of L and because of the misspell they had to reshoot it. So yeah. when it oh, happened really? on TV, it was flat as all hell. Oh. Um, but yo, this place came absolutely unglued for this dude. Um, I mean the C C, crazy. Yeah. And the the point I'm what I'm getting at. I noticed from being at a couple tapings with him there and even watching him on TV coming from WWE, like he knew how to work the crowd mm -hmm. in a way that the top guys in impact at the time um, who didn't have that background, you know, like Eddie Edwards and all them, they didn't have that. They just, they just didn't have that experience. I said the same um, thing about Jay white when he was on impact a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% right. And that's a completely different crowd that he's used to, but he had a presence about him. Um, and it's still much bigger crowds. Granted, the Japanese crowd's completely different, but he still had has experiences in, in front of much larger crowds and what a majority of the Impact audience has wrestled in front of. But I remember that with Alberto and his time with the company. He just had a way of uh, bringing it. He got an energy out of the crowd, whether it was good or bad in a way that no one else was at the time uh, that wasn't a former WWE guy, you know? So these guys, Myers, Cardona, like, you know, I don't know that Cardona will ever be that like number one guy, as, as you said, but, you know, putting him in important angles and seeing what he can do as the heel and even see what Brian Myers can do with giving him a little, some extra, like these guys know how to get, a crowd reacting and, and, and moving and, and, and talking and chanting, you know what I mean? So, you know, some, some guys you just want to, you got to give that opportunity to without, doesn't mean put the title on Myers, you know? Right. Exactly. But, exactly. Know. There's ways to feature a person without them being a world champion. Like this really, this, this <laughs> goes back so much to this conversation I've been having with people online about like uh black wrestlers and the way they present them in AEW and people are like, Oh, you know, this, this, this group of fans is just mad because AEW doesn't have a black world champion. It's like, no, dude, like there's a, there's, there's a huge gap between every black person on your show is a jobber and we need a black world champion. Like there's a huge gap between that, right? Like, yeah. you know, my, my whole, my whole thing is like, you can present people as like strong, credible contenders, just like we just talked about with, uh, with, 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 uh, Zack Ryder. I keep calling him Zack Ryder. I'm sorry. But like, <laughs> you can present somebody as a strong, credible character without them being in the world title picture. Just put them on TV, let them win, let them do their act, give them backstage <laughs> segments. Like there's, you know, there's ways to, to feature somebody as part of your product. They don't have to be, you know, contending for the world title or wearing the world title. So that, you know, again, that's just something to keep in mind for all you wrestling fans out there. When people say you can do better by a performer, you can, you can, it doesn't mean put the world title on them. So, right. you know, stop trying to oversimplify these conversations because you're not smart enough to keep up with it. All right. Um, following her dominant debut last week, Masha Slamovich returns to action against Vert Vixen. Slamovich charges towards her opponent and hits a running boot at the opening bell. Slamovich whips Vixen around the ring by her hair 
and she takes total control. Slamovich hits a big clothesline followed by a modified driver of some kind to score another quick victory. So Masha Slamovich got the win there. Josh Alexander's hit, music hits as Masha Slamovich is uh, walking up the ramp and he you know, shows her a sign of respect on his way to the ring. Then Alexander gets on the mic and reflects on his hard fought victory over Jonah at Hard to Kill, but says that he was just another obstacle on his journey to reclaiming the Impact World title. Alexander claims that Moose will have to go through him if he intends on defending the Impact World title against Zicky Dice tonight. Then out of nowhere, pro wrestling veteran Charlie Haas interrupts and goes face to face with Alexander. They have a back and forth and Charlie Haas says he wants to face Josh Alexander. Josh Alexander basically says, no, I'm focused on Moose. And then Charlie Haas punches Josh Alexander in the face and they have a pull apart brawl. What'd you think about this? So just real quick about the Masha thing, Mm -hmm. you know, they're doing a good job, little squash matches. I love how they put Vervix in over like, Oh, I talked to her today. She said she's going to give her a run for her money. And then she gets her ass kicked in about 45 Mm -hmm. seconds. So doing a good job with the little squash matches, because another thing I had said in the past was that they've impacts always struggled with. um, How do I handle a knockout, a female who doesn't have name name value already doesn't have a brand already didn't come from wwe like they they've always done a good job with getting someone from outside the company in the knockouts and making them strong but as far as just like taking a relative unknown they've they've always struggled with that so i I think they're they're doing well the the finisher i mean it's the driver the grace driver pentagon as a driver mayhem for all you know like it's that's again what i'm saying everything kind of looking the same but and then I thought the nod to Josh Alexander was something different. Like this was the best episode this freaking company has put together in a while. This this was just every. Do you just think they've had little. some different producers? Have have, have, have you, to. Uh, you got you got some ears behind uh, behind the scenes. You should find out if they've added some uh, some different some different uh, voices or minds, or if they're giving some different people input uh, as far as like the 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 put together of the segments. Well, you know. Um, Lewis interviewed Josh Matthews, and I guess he's like the dude now, the producer. But, and at first I hear them like, oh, fuck, here we go, you know, because he, he's been around for years. <laughs> he's just going to continue a formula. But listen to him talk, listening to him talk, uh, it sounds like he does want to present things differently, find different is ways. This, is this an interview that's up on Lewis's channel? Yeah, yeah it's a great interview. Oh, um, mm-hmm. And he talked about Lady Frost's entrance and how do we, you know, and Lady Frost is a great entrance. What they did. Can I just, I'm sorry, I, real quick, I, hold your thought right there. Yo, Lady yeah. Frost, she might have the best moonsault in pro wrestling right now. It's I said nasty. it. Yeah. She might have the best moonsault in pro wrestling right <laughs> now. Dog, Lady Frost hit that moonsault off of the Ultimate X structure. That was bananas. And I watched Charlotte Flair do that horrible moonsault oh, and she's done it in every big arena in the world on every big show and yeah it looks terrible because she lands on her effing feet every time and it just doesn't look like a wrestling move it's just you doing a backflip which is awesome you can do a great backflip but it doesn't look like a moonsault in wrestling and lady frost's moonsault is gorgeous poetry dog. yeah gorgeous. like she floats over and like she comes down like a splash on her opponents outside, like yo, that that mwah. she has hang kiss, time, like yeah. okay, that 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 moon salt is amazing. All right, so that's she's it. That's she all she is amazing. Um, but just a little nod between the two, it, it got people talking a little bit too. But it was just mm-hmm. different. Like that that is the the stepping out of the box thing. I'm always like talking about, like just give us something a little bit different, you know, like heel knockout baby face dude just you know I, th- I thought that was really really cool so um uh the josh alexander thing so people will probably think i'm gonna get on here but i call charlie haas here's another 40 you know we've got pco 49 <laughs> wh- however old, charlie haas 49 years old i don't know how old pco is but he's in that ballpark charlie haas is 49 mm-hmm. i loved charlie haas when he was uh with america um i say america world's greatest tag team uh, I, I loved him back then. So for me, this was just cool. It wasn't spoiled for me. I didn't know he was showing up. Uh, so I, I thought it was kind of cool. 
he he's you know he's definitely looks older. Yep. He's not around for the long term. You know they're they're doing this thing where they keep giving Josh Alexander hurdles and obstacles, and it's good because they they are trying to give Moose uh they're finding a creative way to give him an elongated run without you know because with this um, stipulation of the way he won the title, you would think right away it's him and Josh. Neither of them can lose at this point. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're doing a good job of having them both do something else. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they'll bring it to a head at one point. So that's one of the really good things they're doing. Oh, well, you were asking about the producers. No, I was just saying, from listening to Josh Matthews talk, it, it sounds like they're trying to, to – like he's valuing – coming up with some unique ways to present the show in certain areas. So, you know, I feel good about it, but there's clearly some new blood black back there. It has to be, there's no way just out of the blue. Um, they were just like, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to make all these adjustments. Even the stupid we on the night song was like a little bit quieter than it normally is. Um, I would lose it totally. We all know that, but, uh, but it was quieter. So it's, it's like, there's someone back there. that's like, yo, there's a different set of eyes, different set of ears back there. Has to be, um, but the Josh thing, you know, promo was cool. Uh, but but I I thought the Charlie Haas thing was kind of cool. I, I just I've liked him, so mm-hmm. I, I know it's just there for a match. If if they were like, hey, he's you know the latest signee and he's gonna have angles and you know, like when they brought Kent Shamrock, I was like, okay, that's cool for a match. But then like a year later, this dude's still wrestling, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was one of the worst parts of the show. Yeah, uh, I thought the Bound for Glory where they kicked it off and him and Fulton just started off the show horribly mm-hmm. and the show never recovered from it, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm interested to see the match. I know it's just a wrestling match for, for yeah, the sake yeah. of wrestling, uh, but I think it's going to be cool. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I mean, like, I don't have any um, – Opinions on Charlie Haas one way or the other. I know he's part of the world's greatest tag team with Shelton Benjamin like a hundred years ago. But, <laughs> um, you know, but Shelton is still cooking. You know what I mean? Shelton's still cooking. He's still out there having good matches. So, you know, why can't Charlie Haas? Um, again, I don't like really, I, I, I can't say I've seen Charlie Haas matches that I can talk about one way or another. But, um, but again, like I know this is something for Josh Alexander to do and I hope it's fun. Um and it's 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 a name that's going to get people talking. So again, I think that's good for Impact. Um, I don't think Impact wants to get in the business of, you know, WWE castoffs. Like you know, with Charlie yeah. Haas, we're talking like somebody who's in WWE twenty something years ago. So I would not consider him a WWE castoff. But I just don't think that like this watching? guy was in WWE a hundred years ago. Like that's not the that's not the attraction that you think it is. Yeah, I agree. Um, that that's good for a couple of clicks here or there. But I just don't think that. Um, you know, you just don't want to, you don't want to build around that, man. You want to build around like young, exciting talent, like go find people who have a big indie buzz, get those people, you know what yeah. I mean? Like get those people. I think that's, that, that's the way you want to build a buzz, build a buzz that way, as opposed to, you know, this guy who was, you know, mid card in WWE, you know, 15 years ago. All right. So the Knockouts World Champion Mickey James warns ROH World Champion Rock C that Reina de Reina's champion Deanna Perrazzo will do whatever it takes to win their title versus title match later tonight. So there's a good little backstage right there. Then yeah, Rock, got- Rock C is not a good speaker. Yeah, she, you know, she looks very, you know, people, people were like hyping her up a whole lot and, um, um, you know, she, I didn't she, see she, it. She didn't, she didn't. She didn't have. She didn't have great presence. She didn't have great presence. Um, but you know, that's not to say anything about what she can be. But you know, she didn't come off as like a star of any kind, right here. You know, what Ooh, I mean? yeah, like it's, yeah. It, it takes time to develop that, and you know, I don't see it right now. That's not to say that it can't be there in the future. But I just, I didn't see it right now. I mean, Lord knows, we're talking about someone in Diana Perazzo who, you know, just just needed her opportunity, and she's blossomed like crazy. So exactly, yeah. All right, so we got uh, Moose versus Zicky Dice. Um, so Moose came out in a suit, didn't even take his <laughs> suit jacket off. And I mean, Moose, so the, the bell rang. You know what they did here? Oh, oh, oh. They did the 
Kofi Kingston, Brock Lesnar right here. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but on the debut episode of SmackDown on Fox, they ended Kofi Kingston's six-month title reign with an eight-second squash match against Brock Lesnar. Um, WWE can eat rocks. That was hard that. to watch, yeah. That was really that was really rough to watch. Not as rough here, not going to lie. But <laughs> um, Zicky Dice runs over to Moose as soon as the bell rings. Moose catches him in a urinagi, uh, you know, just basically like a rock bottom and just slams him and, you know, he beats him in like two seconds or whatever that was. So that was funny. After the match, W. Morrissey charged down to the ring. Uh, Moose retreated, but Morrissey sent him a message by laying out VSK and Zicky Dice with a brutal assault. He even chases out to the, uh, to the parking lot, but, you know, Moose was leaving in his, in his, his car. Um, on commentary, Impact Executive Vice President Scott Demore revealed that after speaking with ROH management, the group of Matt Taven, Vincent, PCO, Mike Bennett, and Maria Kanellis are acting as renegades and not on behalf of Ring of Honor. So like you said, they did this purposely to quell the ROH invasion talk that this is, that this is just a group that's doing this and they're not out here acting on behalf of Ring of Honor. Um, Scott Demore, for someone with such an annoying voice, is actually really good on color commentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then we got Raj Singh versus Jonah. I like seeing Jonah come out, you know, after his hard to kill match. I thought his hard to kill match would have been the last time we saw him, um, but instead he came out and you know just beat the dog crap out of Raj Singh. Uh, um, Jonah threw him across the ring, hit a running senton, followed by a top rope tsunami splash, and you know somebody check on Raj Singh, contact his family. There was a lot of matches on this episode, man. Like. It, it, I just feel like we just every time I think we're getting to the main event, like you're giving me another match. Yeah, I man. thought Raj yeah, Singh's man. entrance music was freaking fire, man. And um, did you? The, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really good. And the um, the infidel thing, I, I don't think that's gonna work today. Today's wrestling. Mm -hmm. Um, man, we, we got we gotta do better than that shit. Man. Yeah, like, like, come on, man. Like, I mean, bro, like, come on, like, so, so, okay. Two reasons I'm going to say is I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit here. I'm just going to say this. Like, um, one, like, that's super 1980s pro wrestling. Like, the world is a little more evolved. And also, the world is more volatile now, man. You got, there's, there's a certain amount of, like, social responsibility that these media companies got to have. Like, you got to cut the shit with this, you know, brown people are terrorist and anti-American and all of this shit. Like, yeah. you got to cut that shit, man. Because, like, you know, um, I, I'm sure you guys have probably seen the news by now that um, uh, Mustafa Ali, uh, the guy who plays Mustafa Ali, has asked for his release from WWE. And then I saw another report that said that, you know, that Vince McMahon allegedly asked him to do something that he would never do. Um, and then he hadn't been seen at WWE TV since. And like, it was probably something like this, something like, you know, the infidels and, you know, the all of this shit. And it's like, bro, man, like, this dude was like a cop in Chicago or something like that. Like, bro, like, come on, man. What the fuck, man? Like, can we, can <laughs> we, can we get past this shit? You know, like, again, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, okay. For th this, this show at, is, is a pretty cool platform. It has a worldwide audience, but I'm pretty sure no matter where you live in the world, you saw what happened in America on January 6th of last year of, of 2020. Okay. Um, like America got some shit going on and we try to act like we don't, you know what I mean? We try to act like all the problems in this country are shit from the history books, but like there's some very real like tensions and divisions in this country and they just get passed on and passed on and passed on and passed on. And th there's a certain amount of like social responsibility that people who have big platforms have to take in continuing to sell these images now again that's not to say that like oh man like look man if you got somebody you know who looks like raj singh and he would be a great villain and that's the the the, the act he wants to do fine go ahead whatever like if you think it's gonna be good tv do it but i'm just saying in general when you start taking that approach just know you're gonna have to have a good story because it's old and it's tired and and like honestly i think a lot of people are a little tired of that shit yeah. So like, so if you're going to do something like that, you better have a good ass story. 
So I thought I, I thought the 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 slap schedule thing he said. Um, mm-hmm. th- that's a that's a good original no, no, no. little like I, I would lean into no. that, not the no. not the infidel stuff because I, I I thought that was original. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, actually, so I can dig. Yeah, it. and I like that. I like that though. I yeah. like that. Like, why can't he just be a jerk? Why does he have to be a Middle Eastern jerk? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I said this again, um, you know, years ago when I was doing my podcast with Satch, shout out to Satch, and um, and 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 Jinder Mahal got his WWE title reign. And then he came out and it was like, oh, you guys are just treating me this way because, you know, I look like this and Americans, this, that, the other thing. And I'm like, bro, like if you just look at Jinder Mahal, the way they were presenting at the, at that time, he was basically JBL, the, the, the rich bully. You know what I mean? That's who he was. So like, why couldn't he be that instead of I'm, I'm Brown. So you guys must be racist. Like, why must it, like, why do we always got to go to this? You know what I'm saying? Like, I I don't know. I I mean, like, because look at Rohit, how, how his character and everything overall improved after he got away from like the Desi hit squad. Right. So where they're, they're acknowledging the Indian descent where he just became a wrestler. He happened to be Indian. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, And again, like, Indian can be as much of your character as possible, but again, it's just like this constant method of of this is why this is the whole thing that makes me different. Like, no, you're different. Like, no, if you're Rohit, you're different because like you're a dirt bag and you you trick people and you know what I mean and you cheat to win. Yeah. Like, not because you're Indian, just because that's 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 who you are. You know what I mean? Like, so again, like. I just, I don't know. Like I said, I just think that like wrestling companies just need to know going forward. If you're going to do that, you better have a good story to go with it. Cause otherwise you're going to get called out. You're going to get called out. Cause it's lazy. Honestly, it's just lazy. It's lazy. Like we don't, we don't get away with, with, with trying to say you're a bad guy because of your nationality in 2022. We just, we just, yeah, we're, we're going to do better than that from a storytelling standpoint. It's yeah. just, you know, give me a freaking break. But Jonah All looked right. cool here. That that splash of his looks so painful. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, d- going back to Hard to Kill, that Jonah Josh Alexander match, holy moly. Yeah. Like, you know, them dudes beat the heck out of each other, man. Oh my God. Woo. That that was that was a match, bro. That was a damn match. It's one of those things where again, that's another one of those things where if it happened on AEW, we wouldn't have been able to get away from it. Right, like absolutely. Been talking about it this week. All right, so the influence prepared to challenge the inspiration for the Knockouts World Tag Team titles on January 27th, but they're confronted by Decay, who want to match with them next week. Eddie Edwards has been taken out backstage, just like his friends Heath and Rhino. Then Gia Miller interviews ROH World Champion Jonathan Gresham, who denies any association with the attacks by the group, the Renegade Group of Ring of Honor. Um... And then he's interrupted by Steve Macklin, who accuses Gresham of turning his back on his company. Gresham lays out the challenger. I'm sorry. He lays out a challenge for the ROH world title match against Macklin next week. So he can prove how honorable he really is. So you should love that BQ. You're Dude, I thought it was excellent. I, I really like that. Uh, I think my own, the only like negative thing is, is like, are we going to have Steve Macklin lose again? After this whole, I haven't been pinned, haven't been submitted, and then he loses in a way that I thought made him look really strong. And then, mm-hmm. so I, I don't know, but I, I'm really looking forward to this match. And I, I just like that, the angle and it, it made sense. It was real. It wasn't forced, you know, like you're able to take the Steve Macklin character and gimmick and, and tie it into uh, Jonathan Gresham and honor and it's just awesome. Good so stuff. yes, he's going to lose again. And yeah. <laughs> um, it'll be in a way that makes him look strong, I guess. Uh, don't worry. There'll be no selling in the match. So um, <laughs> it'll just be, it'll be five minutes back and forth of slapping, elbowing, uh, knee strikes and drivers and dives. And um, it'll end in a roll up. So <laughs> strong after the match. <laughs> All right. It was time for the main event. We got Ian Riccoboni and Matthew Raywalt joining Tom Hannafin on commentary for the winner-take-all main event with two titles on the line. Okay, Roxy hit a series of arm drag, but Deanna Perrazzo halted her momentum by tripping her up on the ropes. 
Perazzo began to target the arm of Roxy as she looked to lock in the Fujiwara armbar. Perazzo charged into the corner, but Roxy sidestepped, sending her crashing into the steel ring post. Roxy hit a side Russian leg sweep, but was unable to follow up with a submission due to her damaged shoulder. Roxy hit a code red for a very close near fall. Roxy countered the Fujiwara armbar into the rock lock, but this time it was Perazzo who counters back into the Fujiwara armbar. The referee was about to call for the bell when Roxy stops him. Perazzo transitioned into the Venus de Milo to win by submission. Deanna Perazzo is the new ROH Women's World Champion. Did you see this match? What did you think of it? Hell yeah, I saw it. So I think I jumped to conclusions when they announced this on Twitter because they were just like, you know, this Thursday, Deanna versus Roxy, title for title. And I tweeted, I'm just like, okay, and we're back to, we're not going to, build matches and this and this and this. I think I jumped to conclusions because now that I know what the following card is with the ROH title on the line and some of the stuff they got planned for the next episode, uh, because I think there's, you know, I kind of talked about cliffhanger stuff. Like I'm, I actually really want to know what happens the next episode. Like I think they built into that very good. So I could kind of see where like, we got to have this match now, you know, we can't, uh, I think there's rumors Roxy might be heading to NXT, mm. which I don't think I don't. She is young, but she still does come from another promotion, which seems like what they're trying to avoid. But mm. so, so I will say, I think I overreacted on that. I, I, I can see where, okay, we had to do the match. They did kind of talk about it a couple of weeks ago, but if you think about, uh, I don't know, like, uh, winter is coming when AEW is doing like a TV special, like, you know, the matches well in advance and you can feel, feel them like promoting up to that point. You know what I mean? And the, yeah, they did name drop the match. Oh, what's going to happen. But I didn't feel like there was like a, okay, we know when it's coming. They were, they didn't like build up to it that we knew the match was going to happen. Um, but, it, but after watching the episode, I thought it was okay. Uh, so Roxy, the, I, I don't know. She, she needs a lot of work uh, talking. She, she's cute. She's got a, you know, a, a different look about her. I didn't see anything personally. We, we said this earlier. I didn't see anything that jumped out at me where it was like, hey, this is one of the up and coming female talent. She's good, but I, that's not what I'm saying. I was saying I didn't see something jump out at me, out, jump it out of the screen. That being said, this match was Really, 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 really good. It was better. I, I found it a lot better than the Mickey James De- Deanna Perazzo matches, both of them. And, you know, I said at, at a turning point, whenever they first had their match, Mickey and Deanna, maybe it was Bound for Glory. It was Bound for Glory. I was like, I, I felt like I didn't see the match everyone else saw. I didn't think it was, it was like this crazy, uh, you know, historic knockout classic. I just saw a match, you know. And then I tried to have a little more of an open mind for the Texas death match. And I'm like, I still don't, I still didn't get anything out of these two that, that really made me, you know, excited. And this match did that for me. And the finish was so effing good and dramatic and the camera work of showing Roxy's face where she looked like she was in legitimate pain and crying. And the last thing she wanted, they told this story that the last thing she wanted to do in this earth was tap out and lose her title. You know, they were able to tell that story very well in the last like minute or two of the match. And then it, it got to her pain threshold hit where she, she's yes. You know, like you see her saying, yes, she wasn't tapping nothing. She looked like she had tears in her eyes. Yeah. Freaking great. Excellent. Um, They could have delivered that, you know, any better. And no, Deanna didn't win the knockouts title, but she's a double champion. She's still got, you can, she can still be a huge, big feature part of the show um, as a champion. So uh, I don't know what's next for her. This is going to be like really interesting to see what kind of feud she gets into. If if she might have, it might get to the point where, (coughs) excuse me, Deanna was such a featured part storyline wise of the knockouts for a while. It might get to the point that she just has, they're cycling challengers in for her and, and her 
the focus of Deanna is just wrestling good matches for a while. I can kind of see where they're going, you know, that they might do that. Um, so we'll see. It's, I, which, I, thought which I, it was, think it, I think it's great, by the way. Again, like we talked about this with Rich Swan, right? Like you don't have to have the championship to be an attraction. At this point, Deanna Perrazzo doesn't need the championship. She's an attraction, right? Like I've been out here banging the drum in people's comments in their gear and awards. Like, yo, how are you having this conversation and not talking about Deanna Perrazzo? And I'm sure I'm not the only one, okay? And that's the whole point. That's the whole point. And now that Deanna Perrazzo has uh, the ROH title, guess what? ROH has to promote her too, whatever there is of ROH right now. And ROH has already put out wor the word that they're planning on doing a show in April. So if you're ROH, who do you want headlining that show? Who do you want? Like, who's out there with an ROH title? And no disrespect to Jonathan Gresham, but right now, Deanna Perrazzo, bigger attraction than Jonathan Gresham, okay? And so, uh, so, so if you are ROH, who would you rather have out there carrying your title for the next four months while you're trying to get a show off the ground, okay? Um, you, you're going to try to find a good opponent for Deanna Perrazzo for whatever that show you is you got coming up in April. So this is not a bad thing for anyone. This is a great thing for everyone. Um, curious as to what they're going to do with her impact going forward. But again, she herself is the attraction. I mean, like I, I spoke before about how when she lost the knockouts title to Mickey James, and then she went and, and visually changed her character leading up to that match. Like, you just don't see that in wrestling anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you don't see that where people will change their character for a program. Like, yo, she, she is about her character in a way that not a lot of people are right now in professional wrestling. Like, just little things like that. I'm going to change up the way I look so that when you look back on this in video and you see me wrestling with the t-shirt and the jeans, you know, this was in the middle of my feud with Mickey James. Like, mm -hmm. come on, man. You got to give this woman her credit. Like give Deanna her credit. Like I'm not like, um, again, like I'm not like a Deanna Perrazzo Stan or whatever. Um, but like they gave her a big spot when she came in and all she has done is run with it. You know what I mean? Like all yeah. she has done is run with it. So you just got to give her credit, man. Like I say the same thing about like Charlotte Flair. You know what I mean? A lot of people hate on Charlotte Flair because she was gifted a spot, especially, you know, the fact that they gave her that spot uh, to the detriment of Sasha Banks, you know, um, but, but all she's done is run with it. Like all Charlotte Flair has done is get better and better and better and better. And she's not perfect, but she's damn good. You know what I mean? She's damn good. Um, I remember the end of 2017 when she just kept having banger after banger after banger. And I was like, yo. And I remember like that year, um, I uh, I participated in an article for ESPN.com where we talked about the wrestler of the year. And I remember I, I, I remember I voted for Seth Rollins. And then I thought, I think this was right before that Royal Rumble match she had with, oh, I'm sorry, that uh, Survivor Series match she had with with uh, with with, with um, Ronda Rousey. And I was like, oh my God, how did I forget about that? Because after I saw that match, I was like, there's no way Charlotte Flair is not the wrestler of the year in WWE this year. So I said all that just to say that like, sometimes you just got to respect the work somebody puts in, regardless of the fact of like, listen, this is a TV show, right? Like wrestling is a show. Everyone, no, I mean, I'm not saying people don't like work their way up in their boss's eyes, but everyone is gifted their spots, right? Like yeah. everyone is written into and placed in their spots. Like you're not really winning matches to get a championship. Like the people who make the show say, I think this is someone we can build stories around and they put you in that spot. Like that's the way that worked. But it's, it's, it's on the performer themselves to continue to make themselves interesting, okay? Like, once you get put in that spot, what you do with it is totally up to you. And Deanna Perrazzo has only elevated since her time coming into Impact Wrestling. And you just, again, you just got to give people their credit for, for doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, and then they have Maria Kanellis come out at the end. And I, I, at first, I thought she was almost going to give her her approval because they're both heels. Mm. But it was more... 
I, I don't know what they were getting. I don't know if Maria is acting like she was going to take the title from her because uh, she's not a good wrestler. Right. Um, so I, I don't. You, you know, know what's amazing about Maria Cardellas? All these years that she's been in the wrestling business and how much she's avoided wrestling has been pretty amazing. Yeah. Has it yeah. not been amazing how much did you? And by the way, she's avoided wrestling and still been an amazing feature in on a wrestling show. Like Maria Canellis is dope. I am glued to the TV when she comes on the TV because she is interesting and she doesn't wrestle. Like it's amazing. It's, yeah. She's trained as a wrestler, I'm sure, right? I'm sure that she could get in there and do a match if she had to. But the fact that she's been in the wrestling business for so long and doesn't wrestle, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she, she had a match with Gail Kim at Bound for Glory, which I thought was okay. But then they did like a hardcore match that hardcore, but I actually thought was pretty good. So um, I don't know. Do you get a feeling at all that because you remember they at the end, they cornered Deanna and then. Ray Wall, who I didn't think was as near as good on commentary as people say he is, ran in the ring and almost did the baby face save and then got taken out. Now, granted, Swan and Matt came down. Do you think that I, I think it would be a mistake to do so? But do you think they're they're going to go a little bit of a baby face run with Deanna here as the title as a champion? R- ring of Honor is not there. The way they present is not as storyline based, so it's not like she can just be a heel champion and have good matches. There doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to overthink that, but um, do you think? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. Um, yeah. She's such a good heel. So, like everything about Deanna Perrazzo is heel. Like she has this, she has this voice that is just like, kind of, kind of like, kind of screechy. And, and it just adds to her heel, you know, her healness. Like, it's not nice to make fun about people about things they can't control. You know what I mean? Like her voice is her voice. She can't control that. But yeah. like, but as far as like talking, right? Like um, she, it, it, it adds to her heel thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Is it, because you're not supposed to want to hear a heel talk. You know what I mean? Like you're not supposed to want to hear a heel talk. Um, but everything about her, like I said, her presentation, man. Her presentation, her look, her 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 saunter down to the ring is just like very stank. Like, just, yeah. like, just like oh man, I want to see somebody punch this bitch in the face. Like, you know what I mean? like right, right. <laughs> um, but it's it's so great, right? It's so great. It's so great. Like she's she's a great wrestling heel. She's a true villain, right? And like when 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 that. Texas death match against uh against against Mickey James was like struggling to get off the off the ground a little bit, struggling to pick up speed a little bit. She dropped the two middle fingers, said, F you, Mickey, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like just you know, adding some edge to it, man. You know what I mean? Like, she is a true villain, and there's not enough of these in the wrestling business, period. You know, like yeah. you know, people uh people people act like MJF is like the greatest thing since sliced bread. When AEW did a show in Long Island, this fool was on his knees crying on the stage uh, and jumping into the crowd to, to, to get love from the people in his hometown. I was like, yo, you're supposed to be the, the, the biggest heel in the world. Like, yeah. is this a heel? The, the returning homecoming hero? Like, that's trash. Yeah. So I, I feel like that's something you never see from Deanna Perrazzo. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. she, she's just like in her world only... Her and Matthew Raywalt, and she probably has cats. Like, you know what I mean? Like, nobody, <laughs> you know, no love for anybody else. It's just about her and her titles. And, um, and yeah, like I said, man, like, she's, she's a dope, dope heel. And I think she has, like, ascended to the point where whatever she's doing is an attraction. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's that, that, that John Cena level. You know what I mean? That John Cena level. Again, like, that's not to say, you know, that's, I'm not calling anybody John Cena. But I'm just saying that if you guys remember the last few years of John Cena's career, he didn't need to be the champion. You know what I mean? He was just Cena and whatever he was doing is what mattered. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think she's able to be that at this point, but I'm interested to see, you know, what they do with her next. Yeah. They they don't got to overthink a story with her going forward. Just she's, she's just at a point 
let her breathe, just have her good, have good matches. So you don't have to, there, there, nothing gets stale. And then um, mm-hmm. like Jordan Grace is, if you're trying to push some knockouts, like she, uh, that she, they got to get that prop title offer, but mm-hmm. she, she got a chance to be one of the greats when it comes to the knockouts. If she, if she sticks around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you, you, you know, you just, you just, you just made the perfect point. You just made the perfect point. So um, let's get that knockouts title on Tasha Steels. I'm not saying, let's, I'm not trying to rush Mickey James, but I'm saying let's get that title on to Tasha Steels. Right. And then you can start doing something where Jordan Grace is chasing, have her chase for a while. And then you have got a cash money story. Can Jordan Grace beat Deanna Perrazzo? And Deanna Perrazzo should not lose until this happens. Yeah. Then Jordan Grace can face Deanna Perrazzo, finally slay that beast. And after beating Deanna Perrazzo, then she can challenge Tasha Steeles for the title, whether she wins or not, right? Like, again, like, you just, you just got to be smart about this, man. It's right here. It's right here. The, the, the knockouts... Dude, in the course of this show, we've laid out a year's worth of programming for the knockouts. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 they have interesting characters that you can do stuff with if you just take your time, use your enhancement talents properly. You know, like, again, let's start seeing Tasha Steeles in some of those squash matches like you did Masha Slamovich. Again, like, let's just start building these people. Just build them. Jordan Grace has that digital media championship, so that's cool, man. Let her do her thing where she's cooking right? Where she's cooking and she's building, but not necessarily in a knockout feud. So you can have her and you can have Deanna doing her thing and you have Tasha Steele's doing her thing and you have Mickey James doing her thing. That's four separate knockouts who should never touch until they come together in big spots. Yeah. But they will, they will somehow. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. So. But think about that though, right? Like how many, how many titles can you say we can think of four people that can have separate but converging paths to this title, right? Like, bro, that's a, that's a year of TV right there, yeah. right? Like, if you do it right, you can mm-hmm. build each of these completely separately, let Mickey run, let her reign. Like, I don't know how much, I listened to Mickey James' interview she did with um, uh, Ariel Hawani. If you guys want to check out a good Mickey James interview, she did an interview with Ariel Hawani a couple of days ago. And, you know, it was interesting, you know, one of the things she mentioned is that, you know, she's not under contract anywhere, really. Um, and she, you know, she doesn't know how long she wants to keep wrestling. She's not like doing a retirement tour, but, you know, she's a mom. She has other things going on in her life. And like, you know, she's not like, you know, full time wrestler is not really what she's trying to do right now. So, you know, like, again, like, I don't know how much longer she wants to hold that knockouts title. But I mean, again, like I said, let her run, let her reign for as long as she wants to. And then when she's ready, you know, let her drop it to Tasha Steels. And again, Tasha Steels, let, let her have a good fun run, man. I think there's a lot there. She's got so much attitude, so much charisma. Like you can build so much fun story around her. Again, Jordan Grace has a separate title right now, but she's still a knockout. You know what I mean? Let her keep kicking ass. You know what I mean? Doing her yeah. thing. And again, Deanna Perrazzo, she has elevated herself again. None of these women should touch until it's time, until it's time for a big money match. That's four pillars right there. Mm-hmm. Four pillars of your knockouts division right there that can keep your knockouts division strong, strong for the next six months to a year, you know? So, you know, we'll see what they do with it. Um, I, you already mentioned this, but I'll just go ahead and drop the last part of this. After the match, Maria Cornellis, Mike Bennett, Matt Taven, PCO surround the ring. They surround Deanna Perrazzo in the middle of the ring. Matthew Raywald jumps in front of the beatdown, but he ends up catching the beatdown. Uh, Rich Swan and Willie Mack run out, and they also get beat down. And the show goes off the air as the Ring of Honor group stands tall. Overall, this was a damn good episode of Impact, man. Damn good. Yeah, it re- it really was. Like this isn't just blowing some smoke up company's ass. This this was great. I think they're back on track. Uh, I think it's going to be a more serious product going forward. I don't want them to be too serious. Like you want to have, uh, you want to. Like when I first started podcasting on Pop TV, I was like, man, this show is so serious. Like I wish someone would, like, crack a joke here and there. I don't, that doesn't mean I want it to go the direction of comedy, but you know, you got to have one or two guys there that, you know, break up the monotony a little bit, but I do see a, 
a more serious product going forward here. Like w- when you have this whole, the, the invaders and all that, there's no room for a swingers palace and all that kind of crap. Like they're just, they're just, as you can't, there's no place for that on the show when you've got uh serious stuff like that going on. Um, you know, so th- this is a, uh, th- they're going in a, in a, in a good direction. I- I'm, I don't think this is just like, Oh, we had a good episode. Then they go back to bad habits like this. There, there's some change going on here, and um, I'm very yeah, excited man. for it. Um, did we already talk about the uh, ticket sales for Fort Lauderdale? No. So, so the 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 big thing they've been announcing, and I want to give these guys credit, okay? In terms of like promotion, they they announced I think last week, a couple of days after going on sale. First, they announced Jay White was going to be at the Fort Lauderdale tapings, uh, January 21st and 22nd. Then they announced that the Gorillas of Destiny, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa, I think those names are, uh, they're also going to be at the, uh, the, the, the tapings on January 21st and January 22nd. So, you know, what do you think about these announcements? Um, and, you know, what do you think of the timing here? You know, um, you know what do you think of... Uh, so how about this? I'm looking at the seating right now for, uh, Saturday, January 22nd. And, um, you know, it's not bad, but it's, it's not, it's not sold out. The way they've got it set up is, um, I've looked at this venue and this venue is actually pretty malleable. Um, the way they have it set up on the um on the on the ticket master is there's like there's four huge rows of like pull out seating that they're selling right now as general admission those are like i think 15 dollars seats each um and then on the floor they're building like the typical impact setup that you see with like you know you know uh one two three four five six rows on like each side of the ring like another two, three rows around like the sides and corners, you know, building up to the stage. So there's potential for a huge crowd here, Mm. huge potential for a huge crowd here. Um, You know, this actually is a lot like a little similar to the St. Clair college crowds um, to the St. Clair college setup, but it's different because the way that that they would shoot those, you could see the bleacher seating behind the ring. Right. This way, I think the hard camera will be like at the at the bottom of the bleachers, so we won't see the bleachers, which I think is a good thing. I think it's a good thing because right now, I those I think those general seats. I, I don't I don't think those those sections are sold out at all. Now, if they were, it could sound amazing, it could look amazing, um, but I I think those general seating sections are, are. I don't I don't know that they're going like hotcakes right now. Um, mm. So so I mean like. Does this look bad on the uh, the 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 homies who are the big announcements? You know that they're not really pushing these tickets like crazy. No, because they've Impact's never been a. There's been a lot of improvement with with sales and everything, but they've never been a, you know, buy tickets immediately as soon as they come out type of thing. Um, okay. Now, granted, they did release this schedule a lot sooner than usual, so you would imagine mm-hmm. people would jump on them a little quicker. But they're not in the like AEW uh, announce a pay per view and sell out in fifteen minutes. Like they're they're not in that. They're not. They're like uh, you know the first row might sell out on day one type of thing. You know. Yeah. But there's been over the last couple of years. I shouldn't say last couple of years because they're in Skyway. But there there have been episode not episodes but tapings, pay per views. Uh, I remember the the hard to kill in Dallas when Tessa and and Sammy were main eventing and like the sales Mm -hmm. were not going well at at first, but they initially fill up granted. They're going to fill some seats for free, but they they seem to at the last minute come through and, and and seem to be able to sell the, sell the seats. Yeah. You know, so um, I'm not overly concerned about it. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Do you think that there's anything that can be done in general to kind of change that? To make this more of like a hot ticket where people feel like they just have to, you know, I got to get this ticket as soon as it goes on sale. Um, I just think that the 
what we got for Hard to Kill as a pay-per-view, if they can create that standard that every Impact pay-per-view is going to be like that, because um, I think a lot of AEW pay-per-views get overrated, personally. Mm-hmm. But the feeling is that when they go to pay-per-view, they're going to they're gonna bring it. it it's kind of like, you know, NXT is a much better example, the one you always give. Mm-hmm. But if they can establish, hey, every pay-per-view is going to be a banger, um, yes. I think that's going to be a good start. Because uh, right now we know Slammiversary is going to be good every year. We're to the point now we know Hard to Kill is going to be good. But uh, Rebellion, the very first Rebellion was good. The The last two I thought were just... The last Re- Rebellion's, Rebellion last year to me was like an episode of Impact, personally. With the exception of Swan and uh, Kenny Omega in the main event. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember saying that when Morrow got in the in the booth, it it changed everything. But I was like, up to that, it just felt like an episode of Impact personally. And then Bound yeah. for Glory is always like an Impact Plus special. So uh, I, I think it's going to start with with establishing, hey, our, our pay per views are going to be insane. Um, and then you know, I think announcing people for the sets of tapings like they just did, I, I think is going to is the right thing to do instead of just saying, hey, Impact's coming to town. Like I think you got to give. Um, a special reason to come and watch them because you know that's why how a lot of indie promotions do well is because um, you know like we got Warrior Wrestling up in Chicago it's still a little far for me but we got Warrior Wrestling and it's like they have their group of guys but every month they bring in someone like I mean they had Bret Hart in November right. um, last time I went they had Mick Foley there and you know whether it's a wrestler or a legend, like they have some kind of new attraction every time that's like, Oh shit, this is not just another warrior wrestling show, you know? So, um, you know, it's a formula a lot of indie companies use. So you just can't have a traveling roster. Like there's gotta be a special attraction for each of these there, you know, spots you go to. So hopefully it'll help. But, but I, I think, you know, the banger pay-per-views and getting in the headlines more because of that, I think it's going to go a long way. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that um, you know, we talked a lot about how you know Impact seems content just putting on a good wrestling show, but I think that that is one way where just putting on a good wrestling show can actually really work to your to your favor. Like again, the idea that you can offer people this tremendous value, we're gonna come out, you're gonna see the stars, and then you're going to go home with something to talk about, like an experience of, damn, I'm glad I was in the building to see Jonah versus Josh Alexander. Like, I will never forget that match. You know what I mean? Like, I think, again, like, uh, you know, one thing that we haven't, that we haven't seen yet that we've been harping on for, for forever on this show is the fan testimonials. Like, I think Impact needs, you need, people to tell people that they like impact you know what i mean and and by the way like you know impact definitely skews like an older fan base so you need to think of some ways to speak to an older fan base or if you want to if you want to skew younger which most people do then you need to think of some ways to speak to a younger fan base you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like maybe somebody who is a little older but maybe looks you know younger and and still pretty handsome you know like they just shaved their facial hair and you know they just can you know they, they can they can talk to the youth them you know what i'm saying like <laughs> <you know>? right <laughs> but um no nah, in, in, in all seriousness though man like it looks like the tools are there for impact to make a move you know it looks like the yeah. tools are there for them to make a move in terms of a jump in popularity in terms of how they get talked about and perceived you know openly um it's funny because there's somebody who recently the news was circulating that they were finished with impact. And I started seeing those same notes the same way. Oh, so-and-so finished with impact. And I was like, Oh, here we go again. Yeah. You know, it's never so-and-so decides to, you know, not renew their contract or, you know, impact releases. So-and-so it's so-and-so done with impact. And I'm just like, whatever, dude. Yeah. (laughs) They, uh, it was there was the Matt Striker where they they played it up like yes. Matt Striker done D O N E, yes capital capital done with impact right acting like he he left yeah 
like he's right because that shit. right because that's the way it reads right that's the way it reads striker yeah. done with impact right and just because that reads like this person doesn't want to work for impact anymore that's the way right that right reads. so bleep y'all <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yo, this has been a fun episode, man. Um, listen, I know I keep saying this, people, but we are going to do a questions and comments mailbag um episode coming up pretty soon here. We're gonna make some time and knock this out for you guys, and we're gonna we're gonna surf through the comments and we're gonna find the best comments from the last month since the last time we've we've gone through comments. Um, but keep dropping your comments right here below the video. Let us know what you like, let us know what you didn't like. Um you know, if if um, if you drop your name and where you're from, we'll make sure to shout that out when we look at your comment. Um, BQ, tell the people where they can find you out here in these social media streets. So hypothetically, you could find me at uh, BQ Speaks on Twitter, but that uh, doesn't work at the moment until I can get back into my account, change a password. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, but, don't buy any crypto from BQ. Yeah, def- <laughs> definitely don't do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, BQ speaks on Twitter one of these days, and then uh, you can check out the Instagram. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the Impact Lounge on Twitter, Impact Lounge on Facebook, Impact Lounge on Instagram. Uh, we've been getting some new followers there, so good shit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you can find me at TW Talking About on your social media of choice. Uh, you can also follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. That's T A L K I N B O U T P O D. You can search that uh, on uh, on on YouTube right now, and you can make sure to follow my page and like the videos. Um, actually, I got a, a new pod coming out this week. Should be a lot of fun. We're going to get into some talk there. Um, but yeah, man, you know, like if, if if like I said, you know, drop your comments down below. Let us know what you think. Um, if you like this pod, you know, share it with a friend. Um, you know, drop it in somebody's comments, drop it in their email, send it to them in a text, drop it in a Reddit thread. Okay. Tell a friend to tell a friend. That's the best thing you can do for this show. Let's bring more people into this conversation until next time for BQ. I'm TW ladies and gentlemen, peace.